Chapter 131, Azkaban Duo, Love Good House. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at daptan.com hitch slash reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by Bartimius Barty Crouch Jr. Entered a well-decorated hall with a scowl that didn't suit the beauty of the room. If the gaze in his eyes held magic within them, he would have burned through everything he set his eyes upon. What has made you so upset, eh, Barty? Barty Jr. gazed towards the ornate dining table in the room to see Peter Wormtail Pettigrew reading a newspaper while sitting in a chair with a cup of tea on the table in front of him. He looked relaxed, as if he didn't have any care in the world, as if he was enjoying the small pleasures of life. Moody, that one-eyed freak is weirdly resistant to the imperious, spat Barty with a toxic tone. He has begun to somewhat refuse to answer my questions. Peter looked at Barty. He attributed this to two reasons. First, that Alastor Mad-Eye Moody was simply a freak of nature with an iron will to resist an imperious. And second, that Barty Jr., who had not been allowed a wand for over a decade, was still rusty when it came to magic. Even he himself had been terrible with magic for a few months after getting out of Azkaban. I'll help you to worm information out of Mad-Eye spoke Peter, picking his cup to sip on some tea. It's imperative that we get as much information from him before you go to Hogwarts. You have to know everything about him, from the way he moves to the way he behaves. You will be working in close quarters with Dumbledore. Anything less than perfect isn't acceptable. After they found out that Dumbledore had asked Moody to come to Hogwarts and teach defense against dark arts, the Dark Lord had ordered them to capture the ex or so that they could infiltrate Hogwarts for his plans and schemes for his revival. He had been kept under the imperious curse constantly to gain information about himself so that Barty Jr. could impersonate him. You will help me? scoffed Barty Jr. He looked down on Wormtail as he continued, Don't act all high and mighty just because you found the Dark Lord. I still remember the cowardly you. Don't behave as if nobody remembers that. You'll always be that pathetic rat who twitches at the slightest of movements. You'll never be a true servant of our Lord. Peter set down his teacup back on the table and folded his newspaper. He then stood up from his chair and walked towards Barty Jr. He didn't seem angry at Barty Jr.'s cutting words. If I remember correctly, you cried for your mum during the time you were in Azkaban, didn't you? spoke Wormtail with a calm tone. Barty Jr.'s eyes twitched. He growled. What was it? Only a month with six Dementors assigned to you? That's what you enjoyed in Azkaban, wasn't it? Before your mother took your place and allowed you to escape. You say that you remember the old me, but do you know that the true, Death Eaters you respect who didn't escape Azkaban were there when you screamed for your mum like a fucking whiny little butch? They will remember that. In 1982, his mother's health deteriorated drastically from the stress of her son's imprisonment. In the end, she persuaded her husband to help smuggle their son out of Azkaban. The couple had been allowed to visit due to Bartimius' high status in the ministry and as Mrs. Crouch's dying wish. Using Polyjuice Potion, undetected by the blind Dementors, Mrs. Crouch took her son's place. She died a short time later and was buried outside the fortress under the guise of her son. What you experienced was a happy trip to Azkaban, chuckled Wormchiel, but Barty Jr. could see his haunting eyes. I suffered ten Dementors for over a decade. Do you know how it feels to have everything sucked out by those relentless demons for eleven long years? Not spared a single moment of happiness, to be drowned in misery for a decade. Barty Jr., who thought of himself as the greatest follower to T, Lord Voldemort, became silent for once and listened to Wormtail. He couldn't recognize this Wormtail from the one he knew before. Hmm? Tell me. How is it to be cared for as if you were an infant by a house elf as we experienced hell in Azkaban? mocked Wormtail. Was it hard to get three hot meals, a soft bed, and luxuries? Tell me your struggles, Barty. Tell me the horrifying moments you suffered through while the Dementors hovered over you. Peter stared up at the taller man and smiled. Don't forget that I just didn't find the Dark Lord. If I hadn't found Bertha Jorkins, the Dark Lord would have never ripped past through the memory charm that your father placed on her. If not for me, we wouldn't have come to rescue you. Without me, 
you would still be rotting beneath an invisibility cloak under your father's imperious. All of it had started when the Dark Lord decided to gather information about the wizarding world. He started with Bertha Jorkins, a ministry employee that Peter had brought along with him while looking for the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord had been surprised after he found that someone had put a powerful memory charm on her upon torturing her. After breaking the charm, he learned from her that this year the Triwizard Tournament would be held at Hogwarts and that Alastair Moody, an ex-Auror, would teach defense against the Dark Arts. She also knew that Bartimius Crouch Jr., one of his most loyal Death Eaters that apparently had been imprisoned in Azkaban after his fall and was thought to be dead, was alive. Voldemort, unable to possess her body and mind that was damaged by the spells he cast, killed her. Voldemort also knew that Peter's status would attract too much attention, so he didn't possess his body either. Together, they built a rudimentary body that Voldemort used for travel and performing magic. While in this form, Voldemort was forced to drink a rudimentary body potion made from unicorn blood and venom from Nagini, whom he had turned his horcrux using Bertha Jorkins. After creating himself a body, Peter and Voldemort moved to the Crouch residence. Voldemort needed a loyal follower to help him regain power and easily managed to free Barty Jr. from his father's imprisonment. They put Bartimius Sr. under the Imperious Curse and forced him to keep working at the Ministry as he usually would. The house elf, Winky, who had been caring for Barty Jr. for a decade, was killed without a single thought as she, sadly, provoked the wrath of the Dark Lord. They stayed at the Riddle House in Little Hangleton for a while because Voldemort wanted to stay close to Little Hangleton's graveyard. Still, Peter convinced Voldemort to move to the house of the Crouch family, away from the Muggle population. Since then, the trio had been living in the Crouch residence while planning their future moves. Bartimius Jr., keep in mind why you are here and who you're talking to, because if you don't, things might just surprise you, and that surprise won't be a pleasant one, said Wormtail before walking back to his chair and resume what he was doing. Barty Jr. looked at Peter and recalled a chat he had had with the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord had told him that he had rescued him because of his loyalty. The Dark Lord told him that he didn't trust Wormtail and that Barty's presence filled him with relief in that turbulent time. Right then he understood why the Dark Lord didn't trust Peter Pettigrew. The man he saw now and the man he was a decade ago were just too different. Neither he nor the Dark Lord believed that Peter would look for the Dark Lord after escaping Azkaban, that he would run away from everything and leave behind the life that had put him into Azkaban. But unexpectedly, Peter didn't run away and looked for the Dark Lord. As he stood there looking at Peter, Barty held himself from lashing back. It isn't the right time, thought Barty Jr. The Dark Lord will reward me when he returns to power. Then we will see who matters more. All that matters is the Dark Lord and his return. Barty Jr. gave Peter O. me last look and then turned towards the door. It was time to see his Lord, who had called him to discuss some things. Unlike Peter, Barty Jr. was a true and faithful follower and would never betray his lord. He didn't notice the look that Peter gave him when he turned, missing his cold, calculative gaze. Quinn laid on the bed. He was reading a book that hovered in his head while occasionally turning pages without actually touching the book. His fake wand lazily laid in his hand and his eyes moved left to right on the lines as he moved down the pages. He removed his eyes from the book. He had heard the noise of a discordant crunch and continuous things snapping together, which created a popcorn of satisfying clicks in his ears. The repeated sound rang in Quinn's ears. It was like white noise, but was so satisfying that Quinn had to look at the source of the noise. Quinn watched as a dainty hand picked up tan-colored plastic bricks while adding them to a grand yet incomplete structure with a satisfying snap. One by one, the plastic blocks, which looked like bricks, started to be added to the structure. And with each addition, the structure moved towards what looked like a castle. The conical tops were gray, whereas the rest of the building was tan in color. Luna, there are two protrusions rather than three in the big tower, said Quinn as he saw his blonde junior 
add a mini castle head to the side of two other castle heads that extended from a much larger castle tower. Luna Lovegood looked at him with her dreamy eyes and blinked a couple of times before nodding and silently removing the third mini castle head, leaving the other two alone. She looked at the work in progress, which was a representation of Hogwarts made from what Quinn had gifted her, Legos. At first, she didn't understand the aim of those Lego bricks, but after Quinn sat her down and made a small cabin surrounded by woods from a load of bricks together, she understood the potential of the gift Quinn had given to her. From that day onwards, Luna got obsessed with Legos and started to build so many things from her imagination, from buildings to magical creatures to, well, anything Luna could imagine. Just as Quinn had promised her when he gifted her the boxes full of colorful bricks, tiles, plates, studs, and tubes-type Legos. Are you going to help me? asked Luna, while continuing to add Legos to the incomplete Hogwarts castle, which was only in an initial stage, as Luna planned to recreate the landscape around the castle. Yeah, spoke Quinn, took out a thin a 4 size notebook, and handed it to Luna. What's this? inquired Luna and opened the notebook to see detailed sketches of every part of the Hogwarts exterior sketched onto the numerous pages. Some were up close, others were from far away, from a bird-eyes view, or from the ground. As Luna flipped the pages, she saw every conceivable angle of Hogwarts she could think of. You can reference those for your build, muttered Quinn, and continued to read his book. He had a mental structure of Hogwarts inside his head. He was sure that he knew Hogwarts better than anyone else. So after Luna sent him a magifax about her upcoming build, Quinn drew up an entire notebook worth of Hogwarts shorts. So you aren't going to help me? asked Luna once again, setting the notebook aside. Quinn raised his fake wand, prompting Luna to immediately interject, without magic. Quinn snatched the book out of the air and snapped it close. The book went back into his expandable pockets, and he slipped down from the bed to the blue rug that was spread on the floor of Luna's room in the Lovegood house. What do you want me to take care of? asked Quinn. The viaduct bridge, please, answered Luna. All right, one bridge coming up, nodded Quinn, and his hands went into the box of Legos. As the two Ravenclaws built Hogwarts, Quinn occasionally looked around the room while recalling how Luna's room had been described in the books. He remembered that in the Deathly Hallows, Harry had described Lou, Na's room, and had come across his and the other Ministry Five's faces painted on the ceiling with the word friends written in golden ink, creating a circle around each of them and connecting them together. Currently, the top was bare, with no faces or any other mural painted on it. In the books, Harry described Luna as having pictures of hers and her mother in the frame, and this was true, as he saw Luna and Pandora Lovegood in photos together. But what made Quinn smile was the fact that there were more photos in Luna's room other than her mother's. He saw familiar photos, photos of him, Luna, Eddie, and Marcus, together at Hogwarts. He and Luna together at the AID office. Luna playing catch with Eddie while flying on a broom. Marcus and Luna playing chess in the Ravenclaw common room. A few photos from Luna's second year at Hogwarts, the year she became a part of Quinn's friend circle. Have to make sure that she makes more memories, thought Quinn, and went back to putting blocks into the structure. Quinn, is Hogwarts a girl or a boy? asked Luna. Hogwarts is a lady, Luna, answered Quinn. How do you know? Don't know, I just think Hogwarts is a lady. Lady Hogwarts just sounds right. Lady Hogwarts, Lord Hogwarts. Hmm, you're right, Lady Hogwarts sounds better, nodded Luna. So we live inside a girl? Ivy Potter, Hermione Granger, and Ginny Weasley walked on a stamped-out path between the grass. They were surrounded by trees and flowers that grew in patches. There wasn't a single sign of urbanization in sight. How much more do we have to walk? asked Ivy, as they moved across the small, quaint village known as Ottery St. Catchpole in Devon, England. The village had both muggle and magical communities, the latter being quietly established after the Statute of Secrecy in the 17th century. Four wizarding families were known to live around Ottery St. Catchpole, the Weasleys, the Fawcetts, the Diggories, and the Lovegoods. It's a 15-minute walk, so maybe five minutes more, answered Ginny. She paused to pick up a wild lavender flower. 
She added it to a bouquet of flowers she had collected during their walk. The three were walking towards the Lovegood house on the other side of Ottery's catchpole. The three girls had escaped the burrow, home to the Weasley family, when the Quidditch talk about the upcoming tournament had become too much for Ivy and Hermione. And as much as Ginny enjoyed Quidditch, she, too, wanted to get out, so she tagged along with Ivy and Hermione. After they got out of the house, they thought about what to do and somehow came to the conclusion that they should go see Luna Lovegood, who lived on the opposite side of the village. How is Luna Lovegood? asked Hermione. I mean, I know a little about her. She is a little weird, but how is she exactly? The intelligent witch had once called the quibbler rubbish without knowing that Luna's father was the editor. Luna had heard it and had called her mean. It was safe to say that the two didn't get along well. Even though we both live here, I don't know Luna that well. We played a couple of times when we were little, but then Luna's mum died and she stopped coming over, answered Ginny. The last time she had played with her was when she had been nine. Luna is peculiar to say the least, but if you ignore her eccentric behavior, Luna is nice. It's just that she has different interests. Some call her Looney Lovegood, though, commented Hermione. Er, don't call her that, interjected Ivy. Huh, of course, I'm not going to call her that. It's rude. No, I mean, don't even say it behind her back, continued Ivy. If someone hears you call her Looney, then there are good chances that you'll be cornered later that day. What do you mean? You know, Luna Lovegood is friends with West, right? She also works with him at the AID. So, if you talk about someone calling Luna Looney, then people will come for a talk with you. Who will come? asked Ginny. Hermione wondered the same. West, Carmichiel, and Belby, Luna's three friends, Ivy said. If the person who called Lovegood Looney is a first or second year, then they will be visited by Belby, who will talk to them peacefully and ask them not to call Luna that. If the offending person is a third, fourth, or fifth year, then Carmichiel will corner them and straight out threaten them to back off, or they will get beat up. From what I have heard, one Hufflepuff and two Slytherin did get beat up by Carmichael. Finally, if it's someone from sixth or seventh year, West will call them in for a talk, and then they'll stop. If they call Luna Looney to the face, they'll have to apologize to her on the same day or the day after. If Luna doesn't hear it, then they are only released after a warning. What does West do? asked Hermione as Ivy didn't specify it. I tried asking a seventh-year Gryffindor, but they wouldn't say anything. They would just shake their heads with a cramped smile. No one has given me a clear answer. Hermione and Ginny looked at each other and then lightly gulped. Getting beat up by Eddie Carmichael sounded terrible enough, but from how Ivy described it, getting called in by Quinn West sounded more nerve-wracking. How do you know all this? asked Ginny, as neither she nor Hermione had heard about this. They only started doing this after the Christmas break, she replied shortly, not wanting to reveal that when he had been in his third year, Ivy had kept tabs on Quinn's activities as much as she could. Aha! shouted Ginny, as the wind whipped their hair and clothes. She was pointing upward toward the top of the hill, where a strange-looking house rose vertically against the sky, a great black cylinder with a ghostly moon hanging behind it in the afternoon sky. That's Luna's house, right? It suits her. It looks like a giant rook. Do you see a bird, really? said Hermione, frowning at the tower. I was talking about a chess rook, said Ginny, a castle to you. Ginny's legs reached the hilltop first. When Ivy and Hermione caught up with her, panting and clutching stitches in their sides, they found her grinning broadly. Finally, said Ginny, look. Three hand-painted signs were tacked to a broken-down gate. The first read, The Quibbler, Editor, X Lovegood. The second, Pick Your Own Mistletoe. The third, Keep Off the Dirigible Plums. The gate creaked as they opened it. The zigzagging path leading to the front door was overgrown with a variety of odd plants, including a bush covered in the orange radish-like fruit. Ivy thought she recognized a snargaluff and gave the wizened stump a wide berth. There were two aged crab apple trees without many leaves bent because of the wind, though they were still heavy with berry-sized red fruits and bushy crowns of white-beaded mistletoe. The trees stood as sentinels on one side of the front door. 
a little owl with a slightly flattened hawk-like head peered down at them from one of the branches. Ginny stepped forward to rap on the thick black door, but before she could even raise her hand, the door opened, and someone they weren't expecting greeted their sights. Ivy's eyes widened in surprise. Ha! Huh, what are you doing here? That would be my question as well. Why are you here? He turned his eyes to the younger redhead of the trio. I get why she is here. Her house being what, ten minutes away? The trio of girls stared at Quinn West, dressed in a black collared tee and khaki cargo shorts, a positively clear muggle attire on a pure blood. We were wondering whether Luna was available to play with us, said Ginny. At that point, Luna Lovegood popped up from behind Quinn with sparkling eyes. Play? I want to play. What are we playing? Two pairs of silver stone gray eyes stared at the girls, one excited in dreamy curiosity, the second in slight surprise and gradual acceptance. Didn't we just spend hours building Hogwarts in Legos? You still want to play? Hermione, who heard the word Legos, did a double take because of her current location. She had, Nint expected to hear that Luna owned Lego, or that Quinn had been playing with Legos for hours. Is there a limit as to how much I can play? Daddy has never said anything like that. Quinn crossed his arms and stared at the girls for a few seconds. I suppose. Luna spending time with girls for a change was good for her, he thought. She did spend most of her time with him, Eddie and Marcus. Plus, he didn't have a say in who Luna decided to spend time with. Just tell her dad before you take her out, would you? I'll go tell him, said Luna before skipping back to the house towards her father's study. Quinn turned to Hermione and addressed her. I'm surprised to see you here, Miss Granger. The break is about to end. Shouldn't you be with your family? Hermione, surprised with the sudden question, took a moment to reply. Ivy has invited me to see the World Cup's final. The tickets are rare. Plus, she had already spent the first half of the summer break vacationing in France with her family. Of course, the World Cup's final. Yes, the tickets are rare. Just over a hundred thousand seats to be distributed to magicals from the six continents. From what you told, you aren't going, are you? asked Ivy. Well, yes, I'll be going to see some games. Only I'm not going to be there at the stadium to see the World Cup's final. Quinn glanced back into the house before looking back at the girls and smiled. Now, if you excuse me, I was about to leave, and I should probably leave before Luna comes back and tries to rope me into joining you guys. I'm sure you all are an excellent company, but unfortunately, I have previous commitments. He wasn't sure if he would be able to refuse Luna if she asked him to stay. He spoiled her too much. Say goodbye to Luna for me, if you would, he said while taking out his shrunken hoverboard and expanding it to full size. It was nice seeing you three, Miss Granger, Miss Weasley, and Ivy. I guess I'll see you at Hogwarts. Then he was off gliding away on the magic-powered skateboard-styled hoverboard, and a few seconds after Quinn left, Luna came out while pulling an older man with her. Quinn, you should play with us, huh? Where did he go? He left and asked us to say goodbye for him. Ah, well, nothing we can do about that, she said, and tugged on the man's hand, who looked like he wasn't paying attention. This is my daddy. Anne, do you know that in the books, the attire of wizards is described as robes? But interestingly, J.K. hasn't specified what they wear inside those robes, or if they even wear anything inside. In the books, the school uniform was just Hogwarts robes and no uniform. Movies added the standard uniform that British schools, among many other countries, follow. And just to specify, my version of pure-blood magical society attire is old-style muggle clothing or specific, simplest of the muggle clothing. Barebone stuff like shirts and pants and, of course, suits are necessary. Also, I don't have a clear image of girls' women clothing. I am just going with what Molly Narcissa and Bellatrix wore in the movies. Quinn West, MC. I can build the entire thing under a minute with magic. Luna Lovegood, artist. Lego is her latest obsession. Bartimius Barty Crouch Jr., Death Eater, hates the ones that went free. Technically, he is the first one to escape Azkaban. Peter Pettigrew, Wormtail, that makes him the second one, even though he did it alone, without any help. Ivy Potter, Ivy, keeping tabs. Hermione Granger, Ms. Granger, living at the Potter Cottage since a few days ago. Ginny Weasley, Miss Weasley, Luna's childhood playmate. 
If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 1132, August 25th, 1994, Fury of Noir. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my patreon.com .com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan, Alan Loom. Uncle, I'm going to London, said Quinn as he peeked inside Elliot Dalton's study, inside the West Manor. The older man was focused on his work. Elliot looked up from the documents on his desk. Quinn was dressed in his non-magical styled clothes, which he wore most of the time, except when he needed to wear clothing prevalent in the magical world for appropriate occasions. London, may I ask why you want to go there? Quinn raised his hand. He had a ticket stub in his hand. I'm heading to the cinema. I might return late, so please don't wait for me at supper. I will eat dinner at home, though. So please ask Polly to set up something for me. I see. Be careful with the time, then, and try not to stay out too late, nodded Elliot. Return home before your grandfather goes to sleep. Understood, said Quinn. As Quinn left, Elliot's eyes caught a glimpse of something white around Quinn's neck. Nonetheless, the door closed before he could get a clear look. He shook his head and assumed that it would be some sort of non-magical style clothing. He forgot about the matter and returned to his work. Outside Elliot's office, Quinn started walking towards the manor's door. He looked at the ticket stub in his hand that showed today's date. August 25th, 1994, a week before he had to leave for Hogwarts. Today, however, the day itself was of great importance. Sorry for lying, but I had to do it, thought Quinn as he pocketed the ticket stub that was going to go unused. Determination flashed through Quinn's eyes as he thought of what he was about to do and the possible repercussions that his actions might cause. Among such thoughts, Quinn wished that today went without a hitch, that nobody would know what he was about to do. Everybody would be better if that was the case. With a popping noise as if it was a plastic bag popping, Quinn's feet touched Misty Moore. He had apparated in a familiar place. His eyes immediately looked around to check for any living and observing presence. After carefully observing his surroundings, along with the human presence revealing spell, Hominum Revelio, Quinn concluded that he was alone in the deserted stretch. He looked at a line of wooden posts that were placed consecutively, creating a line. Between the consecutive posts, there were broken barbed wires. When they had been intact, they had formed a fence. Quinn blinked and casted the Point Me Charmy serum in front of him. An arrow appeared pointing north. Then he set off across the deserted moor. He was unable to make out much through the mist, so he simply relied on the north-facing arrow to guide him. After about ten minutes, a small stone cottage next to a gate swam into focus. Beyond it, Quinn could make out the ghostly shapes of hundreds and hundreds of tents. They rose up to a slightly sloping large field. On the horizon, a dark forest could be seen. He dispelled the point-me charm and stopped before he was too near to a stone cottage. The custom-made disillusionment charm he had made from his knowledge of sensory illusion magic covered his body and made him invisible to all five senses. After making sure that he was invisible, Quinn resumed walking and passed by the stone cottage, ignoring the muggle who lived inside and the ministry employee who hid in the cabin in case he asked too many questions and needed to obliviate him. Quinn entered the gate of the campsite. He trudged up the misty field in the middle of long rows of tents. Most looked almost ordinary. Their owners had clearly tried to make them as non-magical as possible. Some, though, slipped up by adding chimneys, bell pulls, or weather vanes. On a side note, there were tents, so obviously magical, that Quinn wondered if its owners were even trying to hide that they were magicals. Halfway up, the field stood an extravagant silk-like miniature palace, with several live peacocks tethered at the entrance. A little farther on, he passed a tent that had three floors and several turrets, and a short way beyond, there was a tent that had a front garden with a birdbath, sundial, and fountain. Show-offs, thought Quinn. The blatant disregard of the statute of secrecy in this place made Quinn realize once again the huge disconnection there was between the magical and non-magical society. 
The law to separate the two communities had isolated the magical society so much that they didn't even know what was considered non-magical. An apparent fault from the education system failing to educate their students about the one thing they are supposed to hide from. He reached the very edge of the wood at the top of the field and stared at the litter of magical tents blocking his vision of the horizon. Every four years, only one event would cause this many magicals to gather in one place, and that event was today. On August 18, 1994, magicals from the six continents gathered at Dartmoor, England, to attend the Quidditch World Cup, and today was the finals between Ireland and Bulgaria. The man in the stone cabin that Quinn passed by, Mr. Roberts, owned and operated many campsites in the area, and one of those campsites had been booked by the British Ministry of Magic for the Quidditch World Cup. Quinn had come here because today was the day the Death Eaters would ravage the campsites and prey upon Muggleborns for sport. Quinn looked up and wondered whether the Dark Mark would make an appearance. Barty Crouch Jr. had been the one who had launched the Dark Mark to the sky over the campground in the original books. Quinn knew Jr.'s backstory, and if the current events followed the original path, then he would be here at the finals, beneath an invisibility cloak under the imperious charm. Jr. would regain control here and come upon the scene of Death Eaters destroying everything in their way. In response, he would get angry and cast the Dark Mark. His anger would stem from their lack of initiative in finding their master, which he yearned to do and yet was unable. An emotional, yet stupid decision. Bringing him here is foolish, thought Quinn. Time made people slack, and it was the case in this situation. He didn't blame Senior that much, though. It had been over a decade since he had kept his son holed up in the house, and only because of the continuous insistence of their house elf Winky and his son's love for Quidditch did Senior allow Junior to come to the finals. Quinn didn't know if the events of the original books would occur today. He knew that Barty Jr. was out of Azkaban because both Mrs. Crouch and Barty Jr. were legally dead, which meant that the events of the original books were followed to some extent. However, he didn't know whether the Death Eaters would attack or if Barty Jr. would be able to regain control of his body. There was a chance that things might go south, though. Because of that, Quinn was there. Let's see how many I can take down today, thought Quinn. He sat down near one of the trees, still invisible, waiting for the Death Eaters to arrive. Scene break. The game was over, and people started to return to campsites from the stadium that had been set up by the Ministry. Raucous singing could be heard on the night air as he stepped back a bit into the woods, where the leprechaun's lantern's light couldn't reach, as they kept shooting over his head, cackling and waving their lanterns. It's time, thought Quinn. He turned himself visible again and started to remove his clothes. He removed all of his non-magical styled garments. Under them was stark white spandex that stuck close to Quinn's body. The spandex had white patches stuck all over, two on the chest, one on each pec, two on the abdomen, two on each arm, one above and below the elbow each, one on each of the back of his palms, four on each legs, one on each feet, and finally three patches that covered his back. Luckily, no one was there to see him, or Quinn would have died of sheer embarrassment. Fortunately, Quinn wouldn't be wearing only white spandex. He tapped his chest, and blue waves of energy traveled throughout the white fabric. After the wave traversed the entire material, the fabric changed, the white transformed into multiple colors. Green-brown, olive drab, dark chestnut, and fern green covered Quinn's body. The spandex that had been stuck to Quinn's body expanded and turned into cargo trousers and a hooded military-style jacket. All of this was over a black, skin-tight, full-sleeved shirt that covered his head, hiding all of his hair. And on the bottom, below the cargo pants, were black compression pants. Quinn raised his hands and saw them covered in tactical gloves. If you look down at his feet, he had tactical boots, both in dark green camo that suited the night and the forest. Every inch of his body except his face's front was covered, and even his face was hidden beneath the shadow of the hood. Project Noir A project Quinn had launched in his second year, just a few days before Quinn had ventured into the Sin Vault. The project had been put on hold by Sin Quinn, 
who didn't like the prospect of hiding himself. However, regular Quinn wanted his identity hidden whenever he desired, so he reinitiated the project. Furthermore, he had started researching and developing a rotation between his projects after the day he encountered in Hogsmeade the Novellus Axionites trying to kill first-gen magicals. He had been lucky that day, as no one identified him or shot a Revelio charm his way to disable his invisibility. But Quinn knew that luck was fickle. As such, he prepared a transformative set of tactile attire, which Quinn would design to change according to his needs. The spandex and patches over the spandex held enough clothing to transform into practically anything Quinn wanted to wear. If Quinn wanted swimming trunks, the material would retract until he was wearing just trunks, or if he wished to don layers of winter clothing, the extra material inside the magically expanded patches would release the required material. The version Quinn was wearing only held non-magical fabrics and didn't contain magic-resistant leathers because Quinn couldn't fit those materials into the designs. Those materials didn't interact with Quinn's magic and would malfunction. Sometimes, the fabric would eject out randomly. Quinn, personally, didn't like transformative clothing like that because they were unstable, and an ample enough magical interference would cause them to break down. Nonetheless, Quinn had managed to accomplish just enough resistance with charms so that this setup wouldn't malfunction. However, for now, if for some reason Quinn's disillusionment was turned off, then his identity wouldn't be instantly revealed. Suddenly, Quinn heard some commotion from the campsite. Time for the invisible vigilante to return. A plume of smoke appeared in his palm. A front mask appeared in front of his face. The gear was complete. Quinn entered the campsite, his invisibility back on as he moved in the dark, unseen. He could only be noticed under the light of the torches as a negligible distortion. And that was only when Quinn sprinted. Under the light of the few fires that were still burning, he could see people running away into the woods, opposite to the direction he was running towards. People fled en masse, running away from something that was moving across the field toward them, something that was emitting odd flashes of light and noises similar to gunfire. Loud jeerings, roars of laughter, and drunken yells could be heard. Then a burst of intense green light appeared, illuminating the scene. A crowd of wizards, tightly packed and moving together with wands pointing straight upward, was marching slowly across the field. Quinn squinted at them. They had their heads under a hood, and their faces were masked, just like him. High above them, Floating along in midair, four struggling figures were being contorted into grotesque shapes. It was as though the masked wizards on the ground were puppeteers, and the people above them were marionettes operated by invisible strings that rose from the wands into the air. Two of the figures were very small. More masked Death Eaters joined the marching group, laughing and pointing at the floating bodies. Tents crumpled and fell as the marching crowd became bigger. Once or twice, Quinn saw one of the marchers blast a tent out of his way with his wand. Several caught fire. The screaming grew louder. The floating people were suddenly illuminated as they passed over a burning tent, and Quinn recognized one of them. Mr. Roberts, the campsite manager. The other three looked as though they might be his wife and children. One of the marchers below flipped Mrs. Roberts upside down with his wand, her nightdress fell down to reveal voluminous mounds, and she struggled to cover herself up as the crowd below her screeched and hooted with glee. They are alive, thought Quinn in relief, and then he moved his head above and watched the smallest child, who had begun to spin like a top, sixty feet above the ground, his head flopping limply from side to side. Good, 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 thought Quinn as he took in deep breaths. This is helping. This is clearly helping. These fuckers are helping me, helping me to bring their doom. Emotions were a tricky factor in magic. A wizard or witch couldn't use emotions any time they desired. Things weren't that simple. If a magical user wanted to draw upon the emotion of anger, but they were happy and didn't have a powerful enough source that would provoke anger, then they wouldn't be able to draw their wrath at all. Any wizard or witch needed to feel the emotion to use said emotion. And currently, Quinn was brimming with rage. He wasn't a person with a solid moral compass and didn't mind inflicting pain to those who deserved it for his own avail. 
but the scene in front of him wasn't right even under the most loose morals. Mr. Roberts and his family had been subjected to multiple memory spells because the magical population gathered here didn't understand how to act like the non-magicals. Because of the magical people's incompetence, an innocent family had their memories altered for a week just so that the wizarding society could enjoy a sports tournament. Now, they were being levitated above and made a joke out of. The children were manhandled so roughly that Quinn feared that they would be injured, and this entire thing was making him feel so angry that the magic was bubbling with fury inside his body. Quinn raised his hand, and the family of four stopped in midair. They stopped flopping around and became rigid. The Death Eaters that were puppeteering them stopped because the muggles they were playing were suddenly out of control, causing the entire march of Death Eaters to stop and stare up. The levitation charm, Wingardium Leviosa, wouldn't levitate living objects, but there were spells created to levitate living beings. The problem with those charms was that the target's internal magic interfered heavily with the control of the charms. If a target's magic was more potent than the caster's, then the charm wouldn't work correctly, or in some cases outright fail without even working for a second. The family of four didn't have magic, so they could be easily controlled, and Quinn's magic was leagues more potent than any Death Eater present in the campsite. Exhausting the core every day for nearly eleven years was nothing to sneeze at. And out of those eleven years, roughly half of the time had been when Quinn's body was in a flux of accelerated growth because of his physical age. The Death Eaters saw the Muggle family being floated away and tried to get them back in control, but their magical attempts were thwarted and snapped as if they were thin, dry branches. Shit! Why isn't this working? Hey, help me out here! Shouted a Death Eater, getting frustrated. Multiple of them banded up together. However, they weren't able to get a hold of the family. It felt as if they were trying to oppose an unstoppable force. They could only watch as the four captives floated away from their reach. What's happening? How is this possible? Why aren't our spells working? The answer came to them in the form of a violet spell light coming straight towards them. One of the less drunk Death Eaters pulled up a shield charm against the upcoming spell, but all that did was spread its effects. The violet spell light came into contact with the transparent shield and didn't cut through it, but created an immense explosion that blasted half a dozen Death Eaters. Who is it? yelled one of the Death Eaters. All of them had their wands out, ready to curse the one who cast the spell. The response was another two violet spell lights screeching towards them. This time, they were ready, and four Death Eaters in front pulled up their shield charms, but once again, the violet spells exploded and made them tumble like bowling pins. The onslaught wasn't over. This time, the violet spell came from their left instead of the front and it scared them because the intensity and size of the violet spell light were thrice as large as before. When the light came in contact with them, the Death Eaters were blasted away like they had been hit by a hippogriff at full speed. Seeing that the Death Eater march was broken, Quinn moved in closer, and as he did, his hands showed in a pale icy blue light that was capable of giving a chill to anyone who saw it. His steps were silent as a wild feline going in for a kill, his stone-gray orbs shining with a calm fury and his magic stirring, deadly. Spells started to shoot out from the disorganized Death Eaters. They tried to take out anyone near them by making a barrage of attacks, but Quinn would simply swat them away like they weren't dangerous charges of destructive magic. The Death Eaters then heard a voice. It was a throaty whisper, distorted beyond what could be perceived as human. It sounded like it came from just behind their ear, yet it seemed like it was everywhere, surrounding them like a blanket. It crept over them like vines of devil's snare, but instead of strangulating them, it told them a single word. Run. Then hell broke loose as a dozen ice spikes whistled towards them. Screams filled among the Death Eaters as one of the spikes nearly tore an arm out of one of their members. Others weren't that lucky as some instantly lost their legs and arms as the ice spikes pierced through flesh and bone alike. The voice once again sounded near them, like it was standing among them. Just like the ice spikes that tore through them, it was cold and triggered a dread inside them. 
It's too late. It was time for the hunters to be hunted. Quinn West, MC, dressed in full camo gear in silent fury. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 133, August 25th, Tatani Nervum. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon and at www.com slash fictionalreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor. A man dressed in Death Eater garb ran through the field while occasionally looking at his back in fear and terror. His breathing was labored from sprinting. He was not used to running, but the threat of pain and possible death was a great motivator. He peered forward at the almost dark night. The moon was the only light source. He ran towards the forest that he could see in the distance. The thought of using a lumos to spread some light in the misty fields didn't even crack into his mind because of the danger it could bring him. I just need to get to the forest, thought the man. I shall be safe then, safe from that demon. Today, he had entered the campsite with a prim perfect Death Eater uniform that he hadn't worn in a decade, but now that same uniform had tears and burns. It was ripped in some places and caked with blood from the wounds that were below it. It wasn't supposed to go like this. They only wanted to get drunk and have some fun with the muggle and the muggle-born. They craved to bathe in the glory they had before they had been crushed all those years ago by the light faction. Then, they were forced to hide their injured pride and live their lives without the power that they had when the Dark Lord was with them. Not all Death Eaters were as rich as the likes of Malfoy and couldn't strut around like nothing happened after their reign broke. Many of them had to keep their heads down and act carefully as the Light Faction built their power. With James Potter in a leading position, he and a group of light-aligned Aurors started to get particularly interested in their dealings. Today was supposed to be a day where they could blow off steam, to show their power and superiority to foreigners and the British Wizarding Society. It was an audience that they wouldn't be able to have even when their lord was alive, and they wanted to make good use of it. Everything had begun smoothly as they captured the Muggle family and played with them while defacing the hideous Muggle tents that everybody had set up to blend in. Just the sight of wizards trying to pretend as Muggles made their stomachs turn, and they wanted nothing more than to destroy the disgusting things that were beneath them. But then, it arrived. He and his companion weren't sure if it was even human. I didn't sound like a human, and its actions and magic were feral. Its spells were powerful, viscous with magic, and every attack that came their way was aimed as if trying to obliterate them. He wasn't used to facing dark spells. It had been years since they had faced attacks like these. During their lord's rise to power, the Aurors were authorized to use the unforgivable curses on suspects, but after that, he hadn't faced a single dark spell in his life. He recalled the stories of Aurors casting Cruciatus Curse on them and the rare killing curse, but nothing like the spells he had witnessed today. Bone breakers, flesh stripping spells, or blood boiling curses, and he could go on. He had seen horrifying spells of dark magic, the Cruciatus Curse only gave them the screams, but these showed them real pain and horror. The Death Eater finally saw a ghostly blue of the forest in front of him, and hope returned to him. I can finally apparate, he thought. Facing those horrifying curses, everyone had the thought of apparating away from the danger. But every time they could muster enough concentration to safely launch an apparition, which was hard considering the sheer horror gore around them, the demon would hit them with a dark spell. The group realized that they wouldn't have a chance to apparate if they stayed together because the demon would easily target them. So everyone ran in different directions, every person for themselves. He remembered the screams of his friends when he turned his back. He had to hold back the impulse to stop and see what had happened, but he didn't dare. The heaving and huffing Death Eater was a stone's throw distance away from the forest, but then he felt an explosive force down on his legs and was sent flying away. He rolled on the ground like a broken doll and his heart thumped in terror. No, I'm close, thought the man. 
I can make it. I just need to take a few steps. I will be safe. The tenacity in the face of death was an impressive force. The Death Eater could see the forest, and all his being was focused on getting to it. He ignored the fact that a spell had hit him and got up, only to collapse back on the ground. Huh? He hadn't collapsed because of an attack. He had fallen because his left foot hadn't pushed him off the ground. He tried again, but he missed, and the left foot didn't make it to the ground again. The man hastily looked at his left foot to see what the problem was and saw an ankle-less stump in place of his foot. The world started to blur and spin as a guttural scream escaped the man. My leg! No, my leg! The pain that came when he realized he had lost his leg made the man more and more desperate. He clutched his painting leg with one hand and started to drag himself to the forest. His mind was filled with getting to the forest so that he could live. Then he felt something grip his right leg, and his heart inside his chest dropped low. For a couple of seconds, the man thought that his heart had stopped beating. Everything went silent for a split second before reality set on him, and at the same time, his body was pulled back by whatever was clutching his right leg. No! Let me go! Forgive me! Without a shred of care, the man was dragged away from the forest. His left leg, which no longer had anything below the ankle, brutally met the ground as the open wound was caked with dirt. The Death Eater thrashed, clutched the grass with his hands, and tried everything to stop being dragged away from the forest. Alas, nothing worked, and soon the forest only seemed a blur in the darkness. The man eventually stopped struggling and clutched his wand tight in his hand. If he couldn't escape, then he wasn't going down without a fight. If today was the day he died, then he was going to take the demon with him. As he continued to get dragged, his body froze when he heard screams. Screams of asking someone to stop, painful moans of apologies and dreadful cries of misery. His relatively shallow breathing returned to its previous labored state. The dragging came to a sudden stop, and the man found himself between two other bodies that he recognized as being Death Eaters that had joined the march today. He shivered as he watched that one of them had his entire right light leg missing, while the other one had deep gashes all across his body. His attention was pulled from the horrifying scene when he felt a chill on his leg and saw that his ankleless stump was now covered in ice, just like everyone else's injuries were. His body tensed as the ice was too cold, and it stung like needles being dug into his flesh. Even a single twitch on his leg would send shock and pain across his leg. Oh, servants of the Dark Lord, your glory is forgotten, just like a mere memory. The man heard the distorted voice of the demon as he fought through the pain. You, who hold yourselves as superior, are now laying down in the mud. You, who committed abominations at this festivity and in the past, are now paying the price. The demon, Quinn, looked at the man that he had just dragged to this place, and with a wave, stripped the Death Eater's wand out of hand. He caught the Death Eater's wand and clenched his fist to snap the wand in half. The now useless pieces of wood were dropped near a pile of similarly snapped wands. Is this the audacity from an order fallen a decade past? He spoke, his voice distorted. You mongrels played with the weak and covered under the strong. Today, you shall feel what is to be unfortunate. Today will be the day that ta shall haunt you. You shall remember it as the day that you lost the one thing that made you special. Quinn took a deep breath and focused his magic. He ignored the wails and screams from the almost fifteen people lying around him. They were the people that Quinn had managed to catch and injure enough so they weren't in condition to run away. A ghastly reddish-black spell resembling soot and haze emanated from Quinn's entire body and slowly wafted down towards the ground. The Death Eater, who had been only hearing the distorted voice of the demon, watched as a reddish-black smoke slowly started to build on the ground, originating from the center of the circle they were all lying in. Those who could witness through the pain had their eyes stuck on the reddish-black smoky unknown that was rolling down in small waves, and as it moved towards them with deathly silence, their senses screamed that this was something dangerous and deadly. They could feel that this was a magic of the darkest kinds, something that oozed evil. Soon, the fifteen people were covered in the reddish-black mist. 
Quinn looked up at the sky and reinforced his decision about what he was going to do. He closed his eyes and recalled the young child who had gone unconscious, yet the scum continued to spin him like a toy top. The rage returned, and with it, his decision solidified as if it was stone. Tatani Nervum, Quinn breathed out, and even though he only used nonverbal spells, this was special. He whispered the words that disappeared among the terrified Death Eaters, who broke the silence of the night, I curse you with a body that shall betray you. The reddish-black mist agitated as it started to radiate in an ominous blood-red light, and with that began the horrifying screams, I curse you to a life with magic that shall be near, yet far from you. The Death Eater's entire body spasmed uncontrollably. Then the blood-red mist glowed brighter. The spasms grew wilder. I curse you with the constant reminder that you are no longer better. An uncontrollable pain flowed through their nerves and, along with it, came an unbearable burning feeling. Quinn looked up at the sky and whispered ever so slightly, I curse you. The mist shone once with a short bright burst of blood red, then it vanished in the breeze of the cold night. So this is how it feels, huh? thought Quinn, staring at the circle of spasming bodies. The curse, Titani Nervum, had been a spell of his. It had been a curse he had created last year. By utilizing his recently gained knowledge of healing magic and human anatomy and combining it with some really questionable knowledge he had found in the Room of Requirement and his own personal library, Quinn had been able to create a really dark spell. He had only a few, though. Tetani Nervum had been inspired by the well-known disease tetanus. Tetanus is a bacterial infection characterized by muscle spasms that could range anywhere from light tremors to spasms severe enough to fracture bones. Other symptoms of tetanus included fever, sweating, headaches, trouble swallowing, high blood pressure, and a fast heart rate. But for his spell, Quinn had focused on the spasms that tortured the infected. The motivation behind tetany nervum had been to disable the target's body. The bacteria that caused tetanus functioned by creating toxins that interfered with motor neurons. This interfered with the regular muscle contractions. Quinn also targeted the motor neurons in the nerves, but replaced the bacteria with magic. The nervous system would continuously interfere with muscle contractions and would cause the body to spasm. As long as the curse was active, the target wouldn't be able to move a single muscle in their body. Their entire nervous system would be out of their own control and at mercy of Quinn's magic. But the sole function of Titani Nervum wasn't replicating tetanus spasms. The spasms were just the carrier of the actual damage of the spell. The real aim of Tetani Nervum came from the word nervum, which was the Latin word for nerves. While tetanus spasms ran rampant, the curse would dig through the nervous system and severely damage it. And just like most of the dark curses, Tetani Nervum had the added feature of being resistant to healing magic. If the target was brought to the hospital, the Medi healers would immediately notice the signs of wounds caused by dark curses. Besides that, Titani Nervum was a new curse that had been created from the knowledge of different magical cultures, which meant that the Medi healers would have a tough time even knowing where to start, meaning that the nerves affected by the corrosive magic would be lost and not able to function. Quinn looked at the piles of bodies, more specifically, their arms and hands. He had snapped their wands and disabled their hands and arms. To wand users who relied on the external focus meant that they would no longer be able to draw on magic, practically turning them into squibs. They still had their magic, but no way to access it. But unlike Quinn, these Death Eaters had been using wands for decades, which meant wands had integrated themselves into their magic system. Consequently, if you took the focus from them, they would be useless. I believe that people are capable of change, said Quinn. He didn't care whether his victims were listening to him or not. Perhaps I'll come back to you to see if you have repented. Understand the severity of your actions and the consequences of decisions. If that day I see that you have truly repented, then your hands and thus your magic shall be returned. That day you will be reborn. I hope you have a better life then. Titani Nervum had been Quinn's creation, which meant that he also knew how to cure it. He could reverse the effects and free them from the curse. 
Quinn had already peeked inside their minds to note their names. If one day these people changed for the better, he would undo the curse. Quinn stood up straight. His work was done. Other than these Death Eaters, all of the others had already fled. Quinn had considered putting an anti-apparition ward around the campsite, but that would mean that bystanders wouldn't be able to apparate out. These are enough, thought Quinn. These many will be enough to instill fear. Quinn was about to apparate out of the campsite, but he stopped to look at the left to see a blue spell light zapping towards him. Quinn tilted his head, and just before the blue spell light reached Quinn, it crashed into an orange, translucent magic shield. The blue spell tried to pierce through the orange obstacle, but all of its effects were for naught, as it couldn't get past. It fizzled away as the magic ran out. Reducto, thought Quinn, and as the shield turned down, he saw the offender who launched a spell at him, and surprisingly, but not shockingly, saw Sirius Black with his wand pointing at him. Quinn noticed that Sirius's eyes were moving between him and behind him. Hmm? Quinn's eyes gleamed in understanding as he turned the magic back up, which was the right decision as another spell assaulted his shield. The only difference was that it was aimed at his back. Quinn turned around to see James Potter also pointing his wand at him. Ah, they were checking, Quinn deduced. He was invisible, and the first spell from Sirius was to see if there was anyone in his place. The second spell from James was one to take him down after confirmation. You, the one who's there, immediately surrender, shouted Sirius. Drop the disillusionment and throw your wand away, yelled James. Nobody needs to get... James looked at the pile of bodies. More injured. It seems I have overstayed my welcome, whispered Quinn and errantly waved his hand for a layer of ice forming a dome around him. It was just thick enough to bear the force of one spell, and it gave just enough time for Quinn to apparate. And with a pop, Quinn was gone. Not even a second after, the ice dome was shredded into shards by the combined efforts of James and Sirius. How was it? My fight erst dark spell. Titani Nervum. I always wanted to make a spell inspired by something medical, and this spell came out. You all heard Quinn's motivation to create the spell. Let's talk about mine. I simply want Quinn's first kill to be special and not some rando Death Eaters. But I wanted Quinn to gain a method to disable people without killing them. When Quinn does kill someone, I want to add some drama, emotion, struggle, hesitation, and other stuff to mark it as a monumental point in Quinn's life. Quinn West, Spell Creator. Need to use weird English. Fiction only reader, author. Next chapter is Reactions. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 134, August 25th, 1994. As the Night Sets. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my patreon.pubrupatreon.com. The link is also in the synlink. It's in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor. In a clearing between a circling of trees, a pop rang, breaking the silence of the night, and a Quinn West dressed in shades of green apparated into an environment suited to his camouflage. Soft steps pressed against the ground, moving the boy forward. The green clothes turned the original white. Audible breathing could be heard in the silence as Quinn's back slid down against the trunk of a tree. He sat down with his legs stretched straight, his arms rested between his thighs. His head hung low, with the eyes squeezed shut and brows furrowed in tension, distress, and confusion. While emotion was a powerful source of magic, it had its own demerits. Emotion could do wonders and elevate the user's magic to the next level when used correctly, but at the same time it would be hard to reign when they exceeded a limit. This would cause some repercussions. The general consensus about some of the vilest dark magic being harmful to the user came actually from the effects emotion gave, as most of those spells required strong emotions to function, usually emotions of the negative kind. Quinn focused on his erratic heartbeat inside his chest in an attempt to calm down and wind down the rage he felt. Seeing the Death Eater's behavior towards the Muggle family had riled up Quinn more than he had imagined. This wasn't saying that Quinn was a saint, he would use magic too on non-magicals every time he went out to the Muggle society. 
legitimacy on a crowd of unsuspecting non-magicals was one of Quinn's favorite uses of mind magic. He would peek into their minds, but he would never use anything he saw against them. He simply used them for practice and research purposes. Quinn never harmed them, and with the time he spent in the non-magical society, it seemed he wouldn't be meeting people who needed to be stopped soon. Quinn felt the rage attach itself to his magic and go through his body, the residual influence of the rage-filled magic when anger had been out of control. His fists clenched hard to stop from lashing out physically or magically. Calm down, calm down, calm down. The words repeated inside his mind as Quinn tried to calm himself down. When he channeled his rage, he didn't feel the effect, but after the outlet closed, the anger would bubble inside. Using emotion-based occlumency to keep the emotions in check wouldn't help as the protection magic didn't erase emotions. It simply blocked them. He had to manually calm himself down to get out of his current predicament. Emotion-based occlumency wouldn't work, but memory-based occlumency could undoubtedly help. Quinn opened his eyes to find himself standing face to face with a grand mansion that elicited comfort and ease. He entered the structure through the rich, brown, elegant doors. Walking on the marbled floor, which reflected him in their shiny, smooth allurement, Quinn gazed around to study the numerous doors lining the corridors. He stopped in front of one of the doors and twisted the golden doorknob to enter the room. Inside, rows of bookshelves greeted him with books filled neatly, ready for him to pick one and dive in. He strolled through the rows of shelves, browsing through the shelves. Some had books on the left, some on the right, others had space in the middle, but all had one thing in common, brown books with golden linings. The touch of the cool leather against his finger as he pulled a book out seemed natural. Quinn's eyes studied the book as his hands felt the weight. There was no title on the book, but Quinn already knew what it was. He raised his free hand, placed it on the cover, and closed his eyes for an entirely new scene to unfold in front of him. A party of laughter greeted Quinn's ears, and when he opened his eyes he beheld Lia, George, Elliot, and Ms. Rosie sitting around able with him there alongside them. His hands moved on their own and threw a pair of cards on the table. Leah stretched her arms and retained the pile of galleons that were on the table, while Elliot collected the cards that everybody put on the table. The poker party from three years ago, recalled Quinn, recognizing the family activity that the West family had played once a while. A smile bloomed on Quinn's face as he looked at the scene through his eyes. He was a passenger inside his own body, reliving the memory through the wonders of mind magic. The mental replica of the West Manor held all of his cherished and happy memories. Whenever Quinn experienced something peaceful, happy, or positive, something that was close to his heart, he would take the memory out of his mind Hogwarts and put it inside the manor. It was a haven that Quinn had made so he could walk in and enjoy everything good that he had in his life. And it seemed to be working, as Quinn outside felt his heart gradually calm down. The burning feeling of lashing out slowly subsided, and a serene smile made its way to Quinn's face. After a couple of minutes, Quinn opened his eyes. They had lost the irritation he had, and were back to his usual cool, collected, rested state. Always remember, add something to maintain balance, said Quinn, groaning as he stood up from beneath the tree. Quinn's personal rule for using intense emotions was to attach another feeling that would ensure that he wasn't solely running on a single emotion. Most of the time, the complementary emotion that granted Quinn control wasn't as strong as the primary fueling emotion, but it was enough for Quinn to escape the after-effects. I should have used something similar from the beginning, sighed Quinn, cracking his back. Controlling his emotions while using rage would have reduced the power by a margin, but Quinn wouldn't have suffered later like he just did. As expected, Titani Nervum for more than a dozen people at the same time isn't a mere trifle. The haze and smoke-styled spell was different from the usual light shot spell or the invisible spell. It had been designed in Africa to cast compatible spells in an area instead of targeting something at a time. The downside of this mode of delivery was that it took increased focus and magic volume requirements. Luckily for Quinn, he had plenty of both. Quinn had accomplished what he wanted despite the problems and difficulties he had had 
while participating in a possible life-threatening situation. Titani Nervum, test subject count 15. Initial results, excellent, severe nerve damage with residual magic that won't allow recovery, whispered Quinn to himself in an analytical tone. Human test phase, stage one complete. Stage two, short-term observation of the acquired subjects will commence tomorrow. Quinn had wanted test subjects for his newest curse, and because of the magic's nature, he wanted human test subjects. The timing had heen perfect as the word cup would be the ideal place to get those subjects. Human subjects that Quinn could use without guilt and morals plaguing his consciousness. Fifteen Death Eater who enjoyed dealing torment and torture. This was all the justification Quinn needed to convince himself. He looked up at the bright crescent moon peeking from behind the night clouds and, Ah shit! I'm late! Damn, damn, damn! Grandfather is gonna bite my head off! For him, the Quidditch World Cup was now over, and just like Ireland, he had come out on top. Scene break. James Potter and Sirius Black watched from a side as the St. Wien Mungo's hospital staff carefully lifted the battered and broken bodies onto their stretchers. That's dark magic, all right, said James Potter. I didn't think I would see something like this during the World Cup. Sickening, isn't it? agreed Sirius Black. And that was saying something, with their career as Aurors for the Ministry. As Aurors, they had seen some extreme stuff, and this was definitely in the upper levels of the most horrifying things they smack had seen with magic. James Potter looked at the unconscious people, clad in Death Eater garbs. Some still twitched and spasmed, while a few had broken bones throughout their bodies. Some of them had some part of their legs cut off. Do you recognize the magic? he asked. The new family head of the infamous Black family shook his head. At first glance, no, meaning that he would have to go to the library and browse through some questionable magic, something he wasn't looking forward to. Do you think that smoke was from a potion or something? I don't know, replied James, remembering the reddish-black smoke that resembled burning soot and haze. Maybe we should consult Dumbledore for this. How about we first take this to the unspeakables first, before bringing an outsider to the investigation. James wanted to reply that Dumbledore wasn't an outsider, but he refrained from voicing his thoughts, as he knew Sirius was right. Do you think Robards will allow that? You know he doesn't like to get help from the unspeakables. With this happening at the World Cup and so close to the tournament, Robards will have to get this over quickly, even if it means involving the unspeakables. The Quidditch World Cup and the upcoming tournament were both international affairs. That would pressure the Ministry, who would then pressure the Aura Office to solve and close the matter as quickly as possible. The pressure chain would start on the top and move its way to the bottom till everybody was yelling. In that scenario, any help was acceptable. Let's forget about that for a second, said Sirius, and he moved towards the ground where the bodies were lying. He squatted on the ground as saw what was left behind. Who do you think did this? James stood by Sirius and studied the scene. There was ice closing every wound, and then the ice dome at the end. He pointed at the heap of broken ice on the ground. This makes me remember last year's attack in Hogsmeade. You mean the Invisible Vigilante? The Invisible Vigilante, the one hailed by the newspapers as the savior of the students of Hogwarts and the wizarding village of Hogsmeade. For an entire week, the wizarding community had read theories on the unknown hero, and for a month, the Auror office had tried to find the person to no avail. Yes, the invisible vigilante used ice magic, and well, he was invisible as well. Now that you say it, the injuries were brutal, weren't they? Wounds pierced with ice, detaching body parts, sealing everything with ice. They were more brutal this time, but I can see a pattern. James nodded and then pointed his finger at the small pile of wood. Unlike the last attack, the wands are broken now. Last time they were stuck to their bodies, but this time every single one of them is broken. Who do you think it is? asked Sirius. My guess would be a Voldemort hater. He only struck twice and only on Voldemort supporters. Other than that, there isn't a single sign of them. Age? Older. Look at the magic. They could take out 15 people, use unknown magic. Those shields aren't a simple protego. It also looked like neither your or my attack didn't phase them much. 
Gender? Your guess is as good as mine, mate. How do we narrow it down? We don't have a visual clue. From the top of my head, we should look at people who have lost family members to Voldemort and the Death Eaters. Sirius looked up at James with a really expression. That doesn't narrow it down. You know how those days were, right? Of course, I know that, said James. But if we add someone good with magic, we can narrow it down by a lot. It's just a matter of choosing how good with magic they are. Hmm. If we are going with that, we can record the spell residue here to get matches against wands, added Sirius. Spell residues against wands was a technique used by Aurors to check if a specific spell came from wands. The caveat of the method was a low accuracy rate and wasn't taken as evidence in court hearings. But Aurors still m ployed it to narrow down their suspect list. Ugh, I wanted to go to a bar and discuss the game. Being an Auror can suck sometimes, sighed James. Sirius laughed at his ex-partner during their trainee Auror and junior Auror days and patted his shoulder. Come on. Let's get this logged in quick. The quicker we move, the earlier we will be able to go home. The following day, the Auror office would get the shocking information about the condition of the admitted people and would realize what the spell had done to them. The invisible vigilante's infamy would travel far and wide. The door creaked open as Barty Jr. carefully stepped inside a large room, trying not to make any noise so as not to disturb the room resident. Barty's eyes were drawn to what lay ahead, as, standing on a nightstand adjacent to a king-sized opposite the door was a candle, illuminating a small portion of the large bed. As he gently closed the door behind him, Barty heard a man's voice, but it was strangely high-pitched, rough, and cold, as a sudden blast of icy wind. You've returned, Barty. Yes, my lord, replied Barty, standing still in his spot. Did you do as I asked? asked the voice. Barty gulped before answering honestly. No, my lord, I didn't. There was a straining silence of seconds before the voice returned, and Barty could hear the much colder response he feared. Tell me why, Barty. All I asked was to brand my symbol in the sky. T there were complications, my lord. What complications, Bartimius? Some of your servants decided to play with the muggles and muggleborns after the game, my lord, replied Barty Jr. And how is that a complication? Wouldn't that have been the perfect time to launch my mark? It would have shown my servants that I have returned, and, as planned, the marked ones would have confirmed it at the sight of the mark growing stronger, said the voice. And by the end, the shrill voice had turned into a hiss. A cold touch on his leg made Barty Jr. flinch into a still stop. He looked down with bated breath to see a thigh-sized green snake slither by as it surrounded him with its long body. He could hear a whispered hiss around him as the snake circled him. My lord, someone annihilated the Death Eaters who were causing the ruckus, spoke Barty quickly as he felt his lord's familiar slowly reduce the radius of the circle. I couldn't see all of it, but when I arrived, all your servants were lying on the ground under the effects of some kind of magic. I couldn't see the wizard who cast the magic, but there was someone there. There was a hissing sound from the bed, and the snake around Barty Jr. His feet slithered away from him without a hiss. Seeing the giant snake leave made Barty Jr. feel safe. He had seen the snake's fangs, and the venom would keep injury wounds open. Come near me, Bartimius. Barty Jr. followed the commands and quickly walked towards the bedside, not wanting to keep the Dark Lord waiting even a single second. His legs bent as naturally as he breathed. He showed his respect by getting on his knees and staring down at the floor. Look at me, Bartimius, ordered the Dark Lord. Barty didn't hesitate. It was an ugly sight, the shape of a crouched human child, hairless and scaly-looking white pale skin. Its arms and legs were thin and feeble. Its face had a flat nose and overall a snake-like appearance. Its eyes shone blood red. When Barty Jr.'s eyes met the gleaming red eyes, a sharp pain assaulted his head. It felt like his brain was being poked with multiple hot needles. Heat, pain, burn, cold. Barty Jr., his screams filled the room, but the next second, his screams abruptly went silent. Voldemort had used a silencing spell to quiet down the screaming Barty Jr. He was in no mood to enjoy the screams and wanted to see what his servant had seen. The Dark Lord dove into the mind without any care and soon he found the fresh memory of the World Cup.
Through the eyes of Barty Jr., Voldemort watched the scene in front of him. A dozen or so of his D, Eth Eater servants were laying in the middle of the campsite while Barty Jr. stood behind the remains of a burned tent observing the scene. Voldemort's expert and experienced reptilian red eye slits stared at the magic of soot, haze, and smoke emanating from the middle of the circle up from his servants. The reddish-black mist flowed down like gas and yet the magic remained within a boundary all over his minions. African, how rare, I have never seen this magic in Britain. His eyes shone with interest. Voldemort continued to look in interest, and curiosity flashed his eyes as the memory continued. He couldn't stop but look at the magic, but even he failed to get any useful clue. He only could confirm that there was someone there, and the caster had used magic that wasn't British. Barty Jr.'s memory ended when James Potter and Sirius Black blasted the ice doom into smithereens, but the person who cast orange shields had already apparated out of the campsite. Voldemort released Barty from the legilimency, and the servant collapsed on the ground, curling up and shivering. I shall take care of this when I get my body back, thought Voldemort. For now, I need to announce. Give me your arm, Bartimius. The left arm, said Voldemort, ignoring the terrible state Barty was in. Barty stood up. His head buzzed, and he had shivers. He groggily and painfully raised his left arm. The shirt sleeve was violently ripped, leaving the faded Death Eater mark in all its glory. A thin, bony hand with an ash-bone wand appeared from the shadows of the bed. The Dark Lord tapped his wand against the mark, and it grew deeper in color. The faded ink slowly regained some of its deep black glory. Some wizards and witches around their houses, pubs, shops, clutched their arms as they had a short yet intense burst of burning pain on their arms. All of them curled up their sleeves to see the dormant mark which had faded thirteen years ago had regained a shade of black. Every marked servant shivered, some out of fear, others out of joy, while many felt both. Down in the crouch home, Peter Pettigrew had put down his fork and knife, while he too looked at the darkening mark. So it begins. A solemn and bleak fortress stood on an island in the middle of the North Sea surrounded by turbulent water. A place where the scums of society were sent as punishment and spent time with the vilest creatures known to man. A place where hope and joy were lost, and all that remained was misery and grim, making it hell on earth. But on this day, with heavy rain pouring down the fortress and seas raging in the distance, the loud laughter of a woman rang out, filling the void and breaking the silence. It was a burst of maniacal laughter that somehow suited the fortress. If there was a type of laughter that existed in the place, then this was to be it. But her laughter wasn't shallow, for there was pure joy, unprecedented delight, and unadulterated elation. Emotions that weren't supposed to exist in the fortress known as Azkaban, but yet there they were. A message had been sent. The Dark Lord had returned. Quinn West, MC, hypocrite of a high order, Voldemort, Dark Lord, let the servants know their master is back. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 135, Arrival, Fake Eye, Triwizard Ra. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at pond.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, like a twisted hose spewing out its first spurt of liquid, a multicolored shapeless mass seemed to appear in the air. The twisted mass divided itself into two parts within a split second before two figures stood on a tiled floor. How was it? asked the taller of the two. A smile graced the boy's mouth as his eyes flashed, wanting praise. The shorter yet older of the two first brushed her clothes smooth before replying to his question. I have certainly been part of worse side apparitions. The not-so-obvious praise widened the smile on the boy's face. He knew that this was her way of saying he had done well. Are you sure this was fine? Asked the strict Miss Rosie as she looked around the King's Cross Station's apparition point. Risking being the one to apparate us here, you aren't supposed to know apparition yet. It's okay. People aren't that attentive. Besides, the delay between the one who apparates and its passenger is almost null. My apparition pop has become quieter and doesn't attract that much attention, 
said Quinn, not worried about the situation. If you say so. The two walked forward towards the platform 944. The Hogwarts Express, a gleaming scarlet steam engine, was already there, clouds of steam billowing from it. Many Hogwarts students and parents on the platform appeared as if they were dark ghosts. Quinn moved his eyes through the hustle and bustle, looking at the new and familiar faces, trying to spot a friend. Ms. Rosie, being a poster lady of manners, was properly walking alongside Quinn, but on the inside, she was delighted that Quinn had asked her to see him off this year. Are you sure you don't want to reserve a compartment? She asked. You can come back out after making sure you have a seat reserved. Miss Rosie hadn't seen the Hogwarts Express since her own Hogwarts days, as, after getting her job, she hadn't had the need to accompany someone to the Express. Neither Adam nor Leah had gone to Hogwarts. Her eyes were stuck to the bright red train, remembering her youth. Quinn shook his head and took out a blue and bronze badge. I'm a prefect. There is a compartment reserved for us in the front of the train, so even if I don't find a compartment, I will have a seat for the journey. Of course, you already know that. Ms. Rosie nodded with a small smile. During her time, she had been a prefect for the Hufflepuff house in her fifth and sixth year and head girl in her seventh. She knew the privileges that the school provided to prefects and the head pair. Your grandfather, Elliot, me, and now you. Everyone in the family has been a prefect now, spoke Miss Rosie. Even Leah and your father held important positions in Bobatons. Quinn already knew that, because he had seen George, Elliot, and Miss Rosie's files in the Room of Rewards that held the black binders and the entrance to the Sin Vault. While he hadn't been there since his second year, Quinn, while searching for clues, had taken a detour to glance at his family's files, and all of them had splendid marks and recommendations. Being the owner of the AID is better than being a prefect, said Quinn, turning the shiny badge to the other side so that it could reflect light. However, I guess it comes with its own advantages. I don't have curfew restrictions anymore. I can roam around all night if I want. While Quinn didn't like the house point system, he appreciated the prefect and head boy-girl system because it rewarded selected students with power and perks in return for the added responsibility. The students who got the student authority positions were the favorites of teachers, and Quinn was all for it. He liked this system because the student who would get the position would necessarily have a good rapport with the teacher, and that was a valuable skill known as knee twerking. One could be excellent at their craft, but if they didn't have the communication skills, that technical skill would only get them so far. He didn't think that the prefect and head boy-girl positions were worthless. Sure, later in their lives, these positions might not matter, but students weren't thinking 10 or 20 years in the future. They lived in the present and wanted to be rewarded immediately. Authority positions were perfect for that. Yes, you can, but please make sure to get enough sleep, said the ever-worrying Miss Rosie. I love sleeping, Miss Rosie, smiled Quinn. Except when I'm doing magic, it's the best part of the day. Miss Rosie studied Quinn for a moment before bringing up the main thing George had asked her to say to Quinn. Young master, the tournament, please don't try to compete in it. None of us want you competing in something that was banned for a reason. The tournament is only for those of age, Miss Rosie. I'm not of age, said Quinn, although that information had been known in the West Manor for a while. We know that, but we also know that nothing is sure with you. Leah was considering not letting you go to school this year because she thought you would figure out a way to bypass whatever measures they put in place. I'm not going to participate in the tournament. Eternal glory and a thousand galleons. That's what the Triwizard Tournament promises. Quinn put a palm on his chest. But I'm a West. Eternal glory is my birthright. As for the thousand galleons, I earn more than that every day in royalties. There is no need for me to join the tournament, although fighting a dragon might be fun. That, that's what we are afraid of, she sighed. We worry that you will try to join the tournament so that you can fight a dragon. Please don't do that. Quinn chuckled, and internally he thought, Well, I guess I don't have to fight a dragon. I have a kraken sparring partner if I ever feel the need. I promise, Miss Rosie, I won't participate in the tournament. 
It wouldn't be fair for the others otherwise, smirked Quinn. Anyway, as I said, I have no desire to join the tournament as a participant. It's not worth it. Promise me that you won't try to see how the Goblet of Fire works. The caretaker who had been looking over Quinn for a decade sharply demanded. Er, ahem. I mean, sure, I won't. I won't go anywhere near the chalice. You aren't doing a good job in persuading me, young master, sighed Miss Rosie. She gave the slightly flustered Quinn a pointed look. Anyway, I will repeat this for my own sake. Do not go anywhere near the Goblet of Fire. It's a dangerous magical artifact, and we don't want you taking any chances. I understand, he nodded. Miss Rosie looked around the platform and saw the crowd getting larger. It's time. You should board the train. She placed a hand on Quinn's shoulder and gave him one good final look. Remember to take care of yourself. Write to us regularly and tell us whenever you have any problems. I will, he said. Then he hugged Miss Rosie and boarded the train with his suitcase. The corridor of the Hogwarts Express was populated with Hogwarts students. Some looked for space to sit, while others were catching up with their friends after the long break. Everyone was in haste to get settled before the train took off. In short, there was plenty of activity inside the train. Even inside the compartments, as there were students whose parents were still around, were saying goodbyes to each other. Within that liveliness, Quinn was dressed in a black, half-sleeved, buttoned-up collared shirt tucked under light brown trousers. He also wore dark brown derby shoes, which attracted eyes as he shuffled along the corridor. For a moment, everyone would stop what they were doing, and their heads would turn as Quinn passed by. Quinn arrived at the front and opened the door to a compartment. At first sight, he saw that it was double the size of the standard one. Inside, he saw seven people already seated, but they weren't talking to each other. Good morning, people, greeting Quinn, his fellow fifth-year prefects, eyeing the prefect badges that everybody except him were wearing over their non-uniform clothes. Some girls blushed a little when they saw Quinn smiling, while the boys sat up straight. He closed the doors behind him, and as the doors closed, Quinn was heard speaking to the other prefects. Before the older prefects come, let's make some things clear. What he said would remain a secret between Quinn and the fifth-year prefects. Quinn smoothed out his Hogwarts uniform with magic and checked the lapel badge over his chest. He watched the Hogwarts Express slow down at last and finally stop in the pitch darkness of Hogsmeade Station. As the train doors opened, there was a rumble of thunder overhead. The rain was now coming down so thick and fast that it was as though buckets of ice-cold water were being emptied repeatedly over everyone's heads. But Quinn seemed to be impervious to the downpour as raindrops seemed to bend away above Quinn as if avoiding him. Yeah, it's good to be back grinned Quinn at the weather. Always, without exception, the Hogsmeade station was wet because of the rain. He looked around calmly, as other students hurried towards the hundred horseless carriages that were standing, waiting for them outside the station. Among the crowd, Quinn noticed a group of three. Of the three, the only girl was waving her hand towards him. Quinn's happy smile dropped immediately as he all but shouted as the trio came near him. Oh, for Merlin's sake, this makes it the fifth year. How in magic do I keep missing you guys? In front of him stood his two best friends, Eddie Carmichiel, Marcus Belby, and his much-loved junior secretary friend, Luna Lovegood. In all five years of boarding the Hogwarts Express, not even once had Quinn seen Eddie and Marcus on the train. Maybe it's the Nargles, Luna gave her two cents on the matter. Couldn't care less, yawned Eddie. He had just woken up five minutes ago. It's good to see you, mate, smiled Marcus, delighted to see his best friend. It could be Luna. The Nargles are surely powerful. I love you too, Eddie. Ah, yes, Marcus, I missed you the most, replied Quinn to his friends. Do that to us too, said Eddie, pointing towards the top of Quinn's head at the diverging rain. Quinn took out his fake wand and the rain parted above his friend's head. As long as it was water, Quinn could do all kinds of stuff with it. As expected, you became the prefect, noted Marcus, pointing at the lapel badge. Not surprising, to be honest. There's no one better for the role. Eddie put his hands on Quinn's robes and fiddled with the blue and bronze badge. I guess we won't have to worry about detentions. As long as you do anything extremely foolish, 
you will enjoy the privileges of a prefect pal. Ooh, I wouldn't fancy crossing the lake in this weather, grimaced Marcus, shivering as they inched slowly along the dark platform with the rest of the crowd. A hundred horseless carriages were standing, waiting for them outside the station. Quinn, Luna, Eddie, and Marcus climbed gratefully into one of them. The door shut with a snap, and a few moments later, with a great lurch, the long procession of carriages was rumbling and splashing its way up the track toward Hogwarts Castle. Did you read about the World Cup? asked Marcus in the carriage. I was there when those people got there, joined Eddie. My father got us out of there quick. Quinn subtly glanced at Eddie. On the fateful day, Quinn had gotten to the campsite before the game started, and while he waited for the Death Eaters, Quinn, while scouting the grounds, had seen the Carmichael tent. It wasn't near where Quinn had dragged the Death Eaters to disable them, but it hadn't been far enough. If perchance a Death Eater tried to go that way, Quinn would be extra brutal. Two had tried, and Quinn had sliced both of their legs cleanly. It's great that you got out early, nodded Quinn. The scene he had caused hadn't been pretty. The noise had been enough to make some people's stomachs turn. The incident had had a lot of media coverage. Afterwards, it had been dubbed as the World Cup Carnage because of the 15 people taken to St. Mungo's. The Medi-Healers had been so shocked that, after stabilizing all the patients, the entire staff had had a meeting to figure out how to undo whatever curse was cast on the 15. Someone from the hospital staff had ratted on the details of the treatment and conditions. The details had been on the front page the next day, and all Britain came to know about the events. After that article, from the second day onwards, Rita Skeeter took over, and she wrote all the cover stories for the Daily Prophet. She picked up on the similarities between the Hogsmeade attack and came up with a trending article that attracted a lot of eyes and ignited a lot of conversations. Vigilante or Villain? the true identity. The catchy headline boosted the sales of Daily Profit and every other newspaper and magazine that covered the World Cup carnage. It had been a boon for Quinn because he could keep track of the situation and the 15 test subjects without moving too much. Rita Skeeter's investigation did all the work for him, and because the story was scoop-worthy, Skeeter for once didn't manipulate the facts, as the facts were juicy enough on their own. Quinn had been happy to see that all 15 test subjects showed favorable reactions. The reactions had been adverse to the victims, but they had been the best reactions Quinn could have hoped for. His sole visit to St. Ty Mungo's while legelimensing the lead medi-healer had disclosed that everything from the shoulder below had been paralyzed because of the intense nerve damage. None of the 15 couldn't so much as twitch their fingers, much less raise their hands or grip something. Through the gates, flanked with statues of winged boars, the carriages trundled up the sweeping drive while swaying dangerously in what was fast becoming a gale. Leaning against the window, Quinn could see Hogwarts coming nearer, its many lighted windows blurred and shimmering behind the thick curtain of rain. Lightning flashed across the sky as their carriage came to a halt before the great oak front doors. People who had occupied the carriages in front were already hurrying up the stone steps into the castle. Quinn, Luna, Eddie, and Marcus jumped down from their carriage and dashed up the steps too, looking up only when they were safely inside the cavernous, torch-lit entrance hall with its magnificent marble staircase. Blimey, said Marcus, looking at the dripping people, all soaking except them. The lake's gonna be in need of what? What? A big, blobby, red, water-filled balloon dropped from the ceiling onto Marcus's head and nearly exploded on impact, but it suddenly stopped in the air. Sputtering at almost being hit, Marcus staggered sideways into Eddie, just as a second water bomb dropped, narrowly missing Luna and almost bursting at Quinn's feet, but didn't, as it suddenly flew away and splashed away from the group, sending a wave of cold water over someone other's shoes and into the socks. People all around shrieked and started pushing others in their efforts to get out of the line of fire. Quinn looked up and saw, floating twenty feet above them, Peeves the poltergeist, a little man in a bell-covered hat and orange bow tie, his broad, malicious face contorted with concentration as he retook aim. 
The first balloon, which had stopped in midair because Quinn was controlling it before it hit Marcus, suddenly turned back and shot towards the peeves, drowning the poltergeist in water. The vindictive poltergeist screamed at being hit from his own water balloon. Peeves! yelled an angry voice. Peeves, come down here at once! Professor McGonagall, deputy headmistress and head of Gryffindor House, had come dashing out of the Great Hall, but then slid on the wet flood, so she grabbed Quinn around to stop Hate Cave, herself from falling. Quinn took the Scottish witch into his arms and effortlessly stabilized her. Ouch! Excuse me, Mr. West. That's all right, Professor, Quinn grinned. She pulled McGonagall up as if she didn't weigh anything. McGonagall then proceeded to screech hell on Peeves. Quinn gestured to his friends to move along. Thank you for stopping the balloon, said Marcus. Quinn put his left arm over Marcus's shoulder. Don't mention it, he smirked. He raised his fake wand with his right hand and moved the water on the floor away from their path so that they wouldn't slip and slide. The great hall was splendidly decorated as usual. Golden plates and goblets gleamed by the light of the hundreds and hundreds of candles that hovered over the tables in midair. The four large house tables were packed with chattering students, and at the top of the hall, the staff sat along, facing their pupils. It was much warmer there. The group walked past the Slytherins, Gryffindors, and Hufflepuffs, and sat down with the rest of the Ravenclaws in the middle of the hall, next to the Grey Lady, Helena Ravenclaw, the Ravenclaw Ghost. Translucent as always, the Grey Lady was dressed tonight in her usual bluish-gray dress, which held an aristocratic elegance in it despite being of simple design. Good evening, she said, staring at the current challenger of the vaults. Good evening to you too, my lady, greeted Quinn to the ghost who led Voldemort to Rowena Ravenclaw's diadem. The conversation stopped as the Grey Lady went silent and Quinn went back to his friends. One of them didn't want to talk, while the other already knew the secret of the first. Where's the new defense against the dark arts teacher, said Eddie, who was also looking up at the teachers. They had never had a defense against the dark arts teacher who had lasted more than three terms. Their favorite, Professor Lupin, had resigned last year. After looking up and down the staff table, they didn't see anyone. Don't worry about it. Whoever it is will be here, said Quinn, looking bored, but inside he was waiting for them to arrive so he could whip out Recon to confirm what he suspected. In the very center of the high table sat Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster, while his sweeping silver hair and beard shining in the candlelight. His magnificent deep green robes were embroidered with many stars and moons. The tips of Dumbledore's long, thin fingers were together, and he was resting his chin upon them, staring up at the ceiling through his half-moon spectacles as though lost in thought. Quinn glanced up at the top, too. It had been enchanted to look like the sky outside, and he had never seen it look this stormy. Black and purple clouds were swirling across it, and as another thunderclap sounded out, a fork of lightning flashed across it. Ah, come on, Marcus moaned, opposite to the other three. I could eat a hippogriff. Just after he finished saying that, the doors of the Great Hall opened. Everyone became silent. Professor McGonagall started leading a long line of first years up to the front of the high table. If the rest of the school were wet, it was nothing like these first years looked. They appeared to have swum across the lake rather than sailed. All of them were cold, shivering and nervous as they faced the staff table, halting in a line. Professor McGonagall now placed a four-legged stool on the ground before the first years and on top of it, an ancient, dirty, patched wizard's hat, and thus started the long yet festive tradition of house sorting. And finally, with Whitby, Kevin, Hufflepuff, the sorting ended. Professor McGonagall picked up the hat and the stool and carried them away. About time, said Marcus, seizing his knife and fork and looking expectantly at his golden plate. Dumbledore got to his feet. He was smiling around at the students, his arms opened wide in welcome. I have only two words to say to you, he told them, his deep voice echoing around the hall. Tuck in, said Marcus loudly as the empty dissonance filled magically before their eyes. The rain was still drumming heavily against the high, dark glass. Another clap of thunder shook the windows, and the stormy ceiling flashed, illuminating the golden plates. The remains of the first course vanished and were replaced instantly 
with puddings. After the puddings too had been finished, and the last crumbs had faded off the plates, leaving them sparkling clean, Albus Dumbledore got to his feet again. The buzz of chatter filling the hall ceased almost at once, so that only the howling wind and pounding rain could be heard. Now that we've sated our hunger and quenched our thirst, said Dumbledore, smiling, I must once again beg your attention. Mr. Filch, the caretaker, has asked me to remind you that the list of objects forbidden this year includes screaming yo-yos, fanged frisbees, and ever-bashing boomerangs. The full list comprises over 437 items, I believe, and can be seen in Mr. Filch's office, should you like to check. Quinn nodded in satisfaction, as none of AID products were on the forbidden list. The corners of Dumbledore's mouth twitched. He continued, as always, I would like to insist that the Forbidden Forest is out of bounds to all students. It is my duty to inform you that the Interhouse Quidditch Cup will not take place this year. There were many murmurs throughout the Great Hall and a few loud what's from the Gryffindor table, but the loudest voice in the entirety of Hogwarts came from the Ravenclaw. What? What? What did you just say? Eddie Carmichael stood from his seat and fixed his eyes on Dumbledore. He seemed as if he had killed his entire family. Every head except Luna's, busy eating an extra pudding, and Quinn with his eyes behind his hands turned to him. Quinn's other hand went to Eddie's shoulder and pulled him down. Stop! Don't pull me down! Why the hell would he say that? Who does he think he? The voice cut off as Quinn silenced him with a silencing spell. Dumbledore went on. This is due to an event that will start in October and will continue throughout the school year. As such, it will take up much of the teacher's time and energy. However, I am most sure we will enjoy it immensely. I have the great pleasure to announce that this year. But at that moment, there was a deafening rumble of thunder, and the doors of the Great Hall banged open. A man stood in the doorway, leaning upon a long staff, shrouded in a black traveling cloak. Every head in the great hall swiveled towards the stranger, who, suddenly, became brightly illuminated by the lightning that flashed across the ceiling. He lowered his hood, shook out a long mane of grizzled, dark gray hair, and began to walk up toward the teacher's table. A dull clunk echoed through the hall on every other step. He reached the end of the top table, turned right, and limped heavily towards Dumbledore. Another flash of lightning crossed the ceiling. Luna gasped. The lightning had thrown the man's face into a sharp relief, and it was a face unlike any student had ever seen. He looked as though he had been carved out of weathered wood by someone who had only the vaguest idea of what human faces are supposed to look like. Every inch of his skin seemed to be scarred. The mouth looked like a diagonal gash, and a large chunk of the nose was missing. But it was the man's eyes that made him truly terrifying. One of his eyes was small and dark, the other was large, round as a coin, and a vivid, electric blue. The blue eye moved ceaselessly, without blinking, rolling up, down, and from side to side, quite independently from the normal eye. Then it rolled right over, pointing at his back. The stranger reached Dumbledore. He stretched out a hand that was badly scarred, just as his face, and Dumbledore shook it, muttering to him some words Quinn couldn't hear. He studied the stranger with an observant eye. The man sat down, shook his mane of dark gray hair out of his face, pulled a plate of sausages toward him, raised it to what was left of his N, O's, and sniffed it. He then took a small knife out of his pocket, speared a sausage on the end of it, and began to eat. His normal eye was fixed upon the lynx, but the blue eye was still darted restlessly around in its socket, taking in the hall and the students. May I introduce our new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher? said Dumbledore brightly into the silence. Professor Moody. It was usual for new staff members to be greeted with applause. Still, none of the staff or students clapped except Dumbledore, Quinn, Eddie, and Hagrid, who both put their hands together and applauded. Eddie clapped to release the frustration he was feeling, but the sound echoed dismally into the silence, and they stopped pretty quickly. Everyone else seemed too transfixed by Moody's bizarre appearance to do more than stare at him. Moody seemed totally indifferent to his less-than-warm welcome. Ignoring the jug of pumpkin juice in front of him, he reached again to his traveling cloak, pulled out a hip flask, and took a long draught from it. As he lifted his arm to drink, 
his cloak pulled a few inches from the ground, and some saw, below the table, several inches of a carved wooden leg, ending in a clawed foot. Polyjuice or not, thought Quinn, and his hand went near the inner lining of his robe. In the end, he exercised patience and decided to wait. Dumbledore cleared his throat. As I was saying, he said, smiling at the sea of students before him, all of whom were still gazing transfixed at Mad-Eye Moody. We have the honor of hosting a fascinating event over the coming months, an event that has not been held for over three centuries. It is my very great pleasure to inform you that the Triwizard Tournament shall be taking place at Hogwarts this year. You're joking, said Fred Weasley loudly from the Gryffindor table. Both twins were grinning widely. The tension that had filled the hall ever since Moody's arrival suddenly broke. Nearly everyone laughed, and Dumbledore chuckled appreciatively. I am not joking, Mr. Weasley, he said, though now that you mention it, I did hear an excellent one over the summer about a troll, a hag, and a leprechaun who all go into a bar. Professor McGonagall cleared her throat loudly. Er, but maybe this is not the time. No, said Dumbledore. Where was I? Ah, yes, the Triwizard Tournament. Well, I'm sure some won't know what this tournament is. As such, I hope those who do know forgive me for giving an explanation. The Triwizard Tournament was first established about 700 years ago as a friendly competition between the three largest European schools of wizardry, Hogwarts, Bobitons, and Durmstrang. A champion was selected to represent each school, and the three champions competed in three magical tasks. The schools would host the tournament once every five years. It had been agreed to be a most excellent way of establishing ties between young witches and wizards of different nationalities. Until, that is, the death toll became so high that the tournament was discontinued. Death toll? Marcus whispered, looking alarmed. But his anxiety was not shared by the majority of students in the hall. Many of them whispered excitedly to one another, more interested in hearing about the tournament than in worrying about the deaths that had happened hundreds of years ago. There have been several attempts over the centuries to reinstate the tournament, Dumbledore continued, none of which have been very successful. However, our own departments of international magical cooperation and magical games and sports have decided that time is ripe for another attempt. We have worked hard over the summer to ensure that no champion would find themselves in mortal danger this time. The heads of Bobatons and Durmstrang will be arriving with their shortlisted contenders in October, and the selection of the three champions will take place on October 31st. An impartial judge will decide which students are most worthy of competing. The prize is a thousand galleons. Fuck it, I'm going to check. On Pete. Eddie hissed released from his silence. If there was no Quidditch, then he was going to use this to get a girlfriend. He didn't seem to be the only person who seemed to be visualizing himself as the Hogwarts champion. At every house table, Quinn could see people either gazing raptly at Dumbledore or whispering fervently to their neighbors. Dumbledore spoke again, and the hall quieted once more. As eager as I know you are, he said, the heads of the participating schools along with the Ministry of Magic, have agreed to impose an age restriction on the contenders. Only students of age, that is to say, 17 years or older, shall be allowed to put forward their names for consideration. Yeah, right, scoffed Quinn internally. Dumbledore raised his voice slightly, for several people had made noises of outrage. Eddie looked absolutely furious. This is a measure we feel is necessary, given that the tournament tasks will still be difficult and dangerous. All the precautions we take wouldn't be enough, as it is improbable that students below the sixth and seventh year would be able to successfully complete each task. I will personally ensure that no underage student hoodwinks our impartial judge into making them the Hogwarts champion. His light blue eyes twinkled as they flickered over Eddie's mutinous face. I, therefore, beg you not to waste your time submitting yourself, if you are under seventeen. The delegations from Bobaton and Durmstrang will arrive in October and will stay with us for the more significant part of this year. I know that you will extend our courtesy to our foreign guests while they are with us, and will give your wholehearted support to the Hogwarts champion when they are selected. In any case, it is late, 
and I know how important it is to be rested to follow class as well as possible. Good night. Chop, chop. Dumbledore sat down again and turned to talk to Mad-Eye Moody. There was a great scraping and banging as all the students got to their feet and swarmed toward the double doors into the entrance hall. An at ten at at zero nine doll. A string of profanities escaped Eddie's mouth. The Irish descendant seemed to have picked a lot of new and innovative terminology in the summer break. Don't worry, I have something planned, spoke Quinn nudging Eddie with his shoulder. I may be able to pull something out of my hat that will please you. The hurling of continuous abuses stopped as Eddie looked over towards Quinn. What? Not right now. I will tell you after I know, said Quinn. He then put his arm around Eddie. Don't try to get into the tournament. Don't even think about it. If you even go near it, I'll break your legs. Eddie felt constricted with the arm around him tightening. It? asked Eddie, struggling to escape, but Quinn's grip was too firm. My fault. Forget about it. If I see or hear you trying to get into the tournament. The sentence didn't need to be complete as Eddie got the message loud and clear. He didn't know why Quinn was so strict about this, but looking at his expression, Eddie wasn't going to argue. Er, Quinn, aren't you going to guide the first years to the common room? said Marcus from the side. Oh, crap! Quinn released Eddie from his grip and turned back to see his female counterpart struggling with the firsties. I'll see you guys in the dorms. Need to guide these little ones to the best beds of Hogwarts first. Go get them, said Luna with a yawn, her eyes drooping. Quinn ran towards the Ravenclaw table. They had been out of the Great Hall after Gryffindors and Hufflepuffs. Sorry about that, he apologized to his prefect companion and then turned to the first years. I am Quinn West, fifth year prefect. If you have any questions regarding anything, don't hesitate to ask me. He paused and gave a smile to every first year student and said, If you check your pocket, you will find something special. The firsties looked at each other as their hands went to their pockets, but instead of empty pockets, they were surprised when the Iron hands felt something. All of them hurriedly took out the mysterious object to find a black card in their hands. You hold the most powerful thing in Hogwarts other than your magic, grinned Quinn as his words got their full attention. Time for advertising, he thought, before opening his mouth to introduce them to his AID network system. After the day ended, Quinn sat on his poster bed inside his dorm room with the curtains drawn for privacy. He could hear the soft snores from his roommates. The midnight moon shone outside. A sizable rectangle of fabric laid on the fluffy bed. With a touch, along with a whisper, the magic inside came to life. Multicolored inks came from within it and colored the fabric in its predecided design. Welcome to Recon. The text and the graphics on the fabric thrummed, spiked with activity as the welcome text in blue disappeared. A detailed floor schematic appeared on the cloth with colorful dots dotting on the map with name tags beside every dot. Three blue dots, Quinn West, Eddie Carmichael, and Marcus Belby sat in the room, unmoving. Quinn looked to the right and saw Luna Lovegood in blue inside the girls' dorms. Two green dots pranced around the common room below. Alaster Moody. The second the words escaped his mouth, the recon schematic moved. The map moved and switched to the fourth floor, near the faculty apartments. A red dot of an outsider with red text showed Alastair Moody in the corner of the room. I guess that because he still hasn't taught a class, he is still considered an outsider, noted Quinn. Recon showed outsiders in red while the teachers in purple. Quinn didn't have to say the other name because another dot walked into the room and moved closer to Alastair Moody. Bartimius Crouch Jr., said Quinn, and he watched as the two reds almost coincided. What should I do with you? The mind of the boy wonder began spinning as some thoughts and plans began to build themselves for the future. Quinn West, MC, bow down to the perfect prefect. Ms. Rosie, West family caretaker, has given her warnings. Eddie Carmichael, in shock. Fuck you. Fuck him. Fuck everybody. Marcus Belby, dry and hungry. Kind as honey. Luna Lovegood, third year, Ravenclaw, sleepy. Albus Dumbledore, headmaster, death toll. Anyway, let's move on. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas.
The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 136. Dada. Unforgivable. Prefect. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, flad patreon.com slash onlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Lutqvist. The storm had faded the following morning, though the ceiling in the Great Hall was still gloomy. Heavy clouds swirled over their heads as Eddie, Marcus, and Luna examined their new schedules at breakfast. Quinn, unlike them, was reading a book from his personal library. Ugh, I should have taken divination. This is getting ridiculous, said Eddie, grimacing about his new weekly schedule. Maybe I could drop care this year. I don't want my OWL scores to suffer. It's our OWL's year. It doesn't matter how many subjects you have. What matters is the subjects you prepare for, said Quinn. His hand held a goblet of chocolate-flavored milk. He continued to say with his eyes still roaming the pages, the OWLs will allow you to take any WT-level subjects. If you think you can't handle all the subjects, then focus on the subjects you want to attend next year and drop the rest. The OWL scores don't matter after that, but the NEWs will matter when you look for a job, so make sure to keep rethinking the decision about what you want to study. Consult with Professor Flitwick or me if you have any kind of doubts. Quinn was going to take the OWLs for all subjects this year just for the flex, but others weren't in his situation. They needed to think about their decisions. With the True Wizard tournament upon them, many students would get swept in the excitement and lost focus. Quinn was going to make sure his friends wouldn't be those people. Today's not bad. At least we are inside said Marcus, looking at the gloomy ceiling. Charms with the Hufflepuffs and with the Gryffindors we have, defense against dark arts. He gulped. He was thinking about their new Dada teacher. I think Mad-Eye is wicked, said Eddie, his face showing that he was somehow impressed by Moody's ghastly appearance. I mean, that eye, the way it rotates in its socket is just, oh ho ho. If you ever lose your eye to a dark curse, I'll make a special one just for you, chuckled Quinn. He took a sip from the goblet. He then took a piece of fruit that Luna was holding in front of him. I think that it's wicked. Never said anything about getting one for myself, shivered Eddie. There was a sudden rustling noise above them, and a hundred owls came soaring through the open windows carrying the morning mail. Instinctively, Quinn looked up. The owls circled the tables, looking for the people to whom their letters and packages were addressed. His magifax, for the most part, had been able to dominate the communication market, but owls were still employed for package delivery. Plus, owls weren't out of the letter business. His own grandfather still used owls to deliver envelope letters for certain correspondences. A large tawny owl soared down to Luna and deposited a parcel into her lap. Looking at Luna opening her parcel, Quinn asked, Are these this week's quibbler? Uh-huh, nodded Luna in confirmation as her dainty fingers ripped the wrapping. There were a dozen copies of the magazine, one each for Luna and Quinn, while others for Luna to sell to the students. Daddy published the article you submitted in this issue. Really? That's great, said Quinn, taking his copy from Luna and flipped through. The magazine in his hand rotated at unusual angles because of the unconventional page orientations. Ah, here it is, smiled Quinn. Ten places to see when visiting Wizarding Denmark. Daddy liked the places you recommended and instantly decided to add it to this week's issue, said Luna, her patent dreamy smile gracing her lips. She had been the one who had asked Quinn to write an article for Quibbler. He says that if you have other things to write, you can send them in, and he will read them over. I will see what I can put together, said Quinn. He was reading his published article, H., he then discreetly glanced at Luna and smiled when he thought about the birthday surprise he had for her. Her birthday was in February, when Silver Moon Printing Magitech would open its doors and introduce Quinn's developing potion, inks, and printers to the world. The Quibbler will be the first magazine to gain color, smiled Quinn, thinking about how giddy Luna would be to see her family magazine in color. His happy mood lasted all the way across the corridors of Hogwarts until they arrived at a classroom on the second floor, after attending the charms class. Then, he was put off by Barty Crouch Jr. posing as Alastair Moody. He entered the room which looked strange and frightening. 
Quinn could just see his clawed wooden foot protruding from underneath his robes. Polyjuice sure is a handy potion, thought Quinn. He wondered how he would replicate Moody's unusual appearance with illusion magic. To make his disguise believable, he would have to add all the tiny details, like Moody's distinctive clunking footsteps, something Barty Jr. didn't have to worry about, as he simply had to strap the wooden leg to his modified limb and be done with it. Mmm, growled Moody, stumping over to his desk and sitting down. All books. You really like books, eh? But let me tell you, they will be useless in my class. Put them away. You won't be needing them. Quinn's eyes twitched when he heard books are useless. If he had been cautious of Barty Jr., now he straight up didn't like him. How dare he say books were useless? The students returned the books to their bags. The Gryffindor seemed excited. Moody took out a list, shook his long mane of grizzled gray hair out of his twisted and scarred face and began to call out names, while his normal eye moved steadily down the list. In contrast, his magical eye swiveled around, fixing upon each student as they answered. Right then, he said, when the last person had declared themselves present, I've received a letter from Professor Lupin about this class. Seems you've had a pretty thorough grounding in tackling dark creatures. There was a general murmur of assent. But you're behind, far behind, on how to deal with curses, said Moody. I'll have one year to teach you how to battle other wizards. Especially dark. You'll only teach for one year? asked Eddie. Moody's magical eye spun around to stare at Eddie. Eddie looked highly delighted that the magical eye was focusing on him. After a moment, Moody smiled, the first time anyone had seen him do so. His heavily scarred face looked more twisted and contorted than ever. I'm retired, lad, said Moody. Yeah, I'm staying for just one year. Special favor to Dumbledore. One year, and then I'll be back to my quiet home. He gave a harsh laugh and then clapped his gnarled hands together. So, let's get into it. Curses. They have forms and uses. Now, according to the Ministry of Magic, I'm supposed to teach you counter curses and leave it at that. I'm not supposed to show you what illegal dark curses look like until you're in sixth year. You're supposedly not mature enough to deal with them till then. But Professor Dumbledore's got a higher opinion of your nerves, and he reckons you can cope. Really? It surprised Quinn that Dumbledore would give his approval to this. On a second thought, Hogwarts was Dumbledore's school, so it made sense that Moody would take permission from Dumbledore. And I say, the sooner you know what you're up against, the better. How are you supposed to defend yourself against something you've never seen? A wizard who's about to put an illegal curse on you isn't going to tell you what he's about to do. He's not going to be friendly and polite about it. You need to be prepared. You need to be constantly alert and watchful. Quinn internally debated that. He could be friendly and polite and still curse someone with some colorful spells, get into their personal space without making them suspicious and strike when they weren't expecting it. Ambush 101 Mr. Belby, put that away when I'm talky. Neng, said Moody. Marcus jumped in his seat and blushed in fluster. He had been reading the book under his desk. X-ray. Huh, noted Quinn. Your uncle did a great deed to wizard kind, so I'm gonna let that go. Make sure it doesn't happen again, said Moody, and Marcus shyly nodded, embarrassed. So, do any of you know which curses are most heavily punished by wizarding law? Every Ravenclaw raised their hand, and even several Gryffindor's hands rose tentatively into the air. Moody pointed at Katie Bell, but his magical eye was still fixed on Marcus. The unforgivable curses, sir, answered Katie. How many are there, Miss Bell? Three, sir. Correct. Mr. Carmichael, can you name the curses? asked Moody. Eddie got up and answered, the Imperious Curse, Cruciatus Curse, and the Killing Curse. He gulped nervously at the end. Yes, be scared, lad. The three unforgivables aren't nothing to sneeze at. Moody's regular eye and magical eye moved in all directions to look at the entire class, who became uncomfortable under his gaze. All of you should feel fear at those names. Fear will keep you sharp. Constant vigilance, he barked, and almost everybody jumped. That's what you need to do to be safe. Moody then opened his desk drawer and took out a glass jar. Three large black spiders were scuttling around inside it. He reached into the jar, caught one of the spiders, and held it in the palm of his hand so that they could all see it. He then pointed his wand at it and muttered, 
Imperio. The spider leaped from Moody's hand on a fine thread of silk and began to swing backward and forward as though on a trapeze. It stretched out its legs rigidly, then did a backflip, breaking the thread and landing on the desk, where it began to cartwheel in circles. Moody jerked his wand, and the spider rose onto two of its hind legs and went into what was unmistakably a tap dance. Everyone laughed, except a few, like Moody, Quinn, and Marcus. Think it's funny, do you? Moody growled. Total control. I could make it jump out of the window, drown itself, throw itself down one of your throats. You'd like it then, if I did it to you? The laughter died away almost instantly. You are in your OWL year, already big boys and girls, old enough to be responsible. Any volunteers who would come here and show the class what it feels like to be cursed with the imperious? Said Moody, and with his magical eye constantly turning, he loudly asked. The imperious curse can be fought, and I'll be teaching you how, but it takes real strength of character, and not everyone can do it. The entire class looked uncomfortable. No one wanted to get an unforgivable cast on them. Moody turned towards where Gryffindor sat, but suddenly stopped as his magical eye rolled over into the back of his head. Mr. West, do you have a question to ask? He said, turning towards the Ravenclaw to see Quinn raising his hand. No, Professor. I would like to volunteer for the imperious curse, that is, answered Quinn. Every person, including Moody, opened their eyes so much that it seemed they would almost pop out. They couldn't comprehend or believe what they were seeing and hearing. Him raising his hand and confirming his decision to volunteer was mind-boggling to them. Quinn, whispered Marcus harshly, something not usually seen from the gentle Ravenclaw. What are you doing? Put that hand down. Have you gone mad? Marcus's words went ignored as Quinn and Moody stared at each other. All right, lad, come on then, nodded Moody and looked at the rest of the class. You don't know, but you're lucky that you are fortunate to have a classmate like this. You'll be able to witness one of the unforgivable curses in a classroom without any danger. Quinn stood up, patted an anxious Marcus's shoulder, and stepped outside to the front with several pairs of eyes following his every move. The disguised Death Eater and the volunteering student stood facing each other. One had a scarred and weathered face, and the other was young and handsome. Are you sure, lad? asked Moody. You might regret it. As you said, Professor, it's a golden opportunity for me to see how the imperious works. Better experience it now, rather than at an unfortunate time. No one in Quinn's life would willingly cast an imperious curse on him. His family would shut it down before he could say the un of the unforgivables. Quinn was sure that he would be harshly reprimanded on even bringing the topic up. The only person who would remotely be willing to cast an unforgivable on him would be his teacher, Alan D. Baddeley. If Quinn asked Alan to cast Imperius, not sure about Cruciatus' curse, on him, the old man would do it without hesitation and quite happily. But Alan wasn't nearby, and Quinn couldn't ask Alan to drop by so that he could cast an Imperius on him. Moody was the perfect opportunity to get exposure to the imperious curse. Remember, you asked for it, said Moody, and his wand went up pointing at Quinn. Imperio. It was a most wonderful feeling. Quinn felt as if he was floating, a sensation where all worries were wiped gently away, leaving nothing but a vague, untraceable happiness. He stood there feeling immensely relaxed, only dimly aware that everyone was watching him. And then he heard Mad-Eye Moody's voice, echoing in some distant chamber of his empty brain. Give me all the monies you have to me. Give all the money you have on you to me. Hmm. Yeah, right. Like I would do that. Quinn enjoyed the floating sensation, but scoffed at the part where the voice asked him to fork out his money. Give me all your monies to me. Hey, it's my money. I earned it. This relaxing feeling is nice. Besides, who says monies nowadays? Give them to me right now. Aight. This got old pretty quickly, thought Quinn, and his magic moved at his command. Like a glass dropping on the floor, all the fluffy goodness Quinn was feeling shattered. Quinn raised his hand and fixed his already-in-place necktie. Thank you for that, Professor. It was a unique experience, internally thinking, next time I'll shatter the effects the second I start feeling good. Look at that. West fought the curse. He fought it, and he beat it, growled Moody in a happy voice. We'll try that again, West. The rest of you, pay attention. Watch his eyes, 
that's where you see it. That's perfect, West. Outstanding indeed. Anyone will have trouble controlling you. Quinn exited the class feeling happy, as Moody cast the Imperius five more times to him, making Quinn more familiar with the curse. His confidence was high, he had fought off Barty Jr.'s Imperius without any effort, which made Quinn feel like if someone more powerful than Barty Jr. cast Imperius on him, he would have high chances to escape its effects with some struggle and would have a chance to resist it, rather than to instantly lose control of himself. Quinn? How are you feeling, mate? Do you feel sick? Should I take you to the hospital wing? Asked Marcus, his face etched with deep worry. He wasn't comfortable with his best friend being subjected to the imperious curse. I'm fine, Marcus, said Quinn, putting his arm over Marcus's shoulder. If you see me acting funny, just sock me in the face and take me to a faculty member, preferably Madame Pomfrey, then Professor Flitwick, followed by Professor McGonagall, and finally, Professor Potter. I'll be happy to do that, grinned Eddie. You too? Marcus couldn't believe how lightly they were taking the matter. Marcus, this is just the start. Today he only showed the Imperius on a spider. He will show the other two in the next class. Be ready for it, said Quinn. But, but, don't worry about it. I will be there, mate. You don't have to worry about anything. I'll take care of you if anything goes wrong. Quinn, thank you. That means a lot. Eddie gagged on the side and spoke. Get a room. It was after curfew, and Quinn was sitting at his office's table. His hands held a pair of stainless steel micro-tweezers with tiny metal gears gripped at the end. In front of him was an open timepiece with gears and springs inside. It was Quinn's new timepiece, and he was currently building it from scratch. The knock on the office door startled Quinn, and he ended up jamming the tweezers inside the mechanism, screwing his progress, rendering it null and void. He pursed his lips, held back a groan, and finally licked his lips to hold back his frustration. He looked at the work-in-progress timepiece. He could assemble the mechanism in under ten seconds with one call, and Quinn was tempted to use magic but held back. He wasn't one to give up. Come in, he called, placing the tweezers down. To his surprise, Minerva McGonagall, the deputy headmistress, entered the office. And from the looks of it, she wasn't happy. Professor, what can I do for you today? Mr. West, may I know why aren't you patrolling your assigned area for curfew offending students, she asked, feeling a little strange that she was saying this to the prime curfew offender in Hogwarts history. But I'm patrolling, Professor. I'm patrolling my area, smiled Quinn. I handle everything from my office, which is the entire west block of the fifth floor. I don't see you patrolling, Mr. West. I don't need to patrol physically, Professor, grinned Quinn and pointed to his forehead. I have layered my entire area with wards. If someone walks inside my area, they will trigger the wards. Quinn's office was on the edge of the west block, so Quinn would know if someone walked five meters west past his office. Working hard is good, Professor, but that is if you work smart. If someone enters the area, I can simply get up and chase them down instead of aimlessly roaming a fixed route. And what if you don't get this area again? asked McGonagall. Quinn chuckled and interlinked his fingers over his table. We prefects along with the head pair have already distributed the castle, and I got this area for the rest of the year. If they reassign me, I can ward the area again and set my base in another classroom. Though I doubt I'll be losing this area anytime soon, I can be very persuasive. Of course, I know that, Mr. West, sighed McGonagall. She was surprised by the patrolling approach, but when she took Quinn West into consideration, it wasn't surprising at all. Mr. West, I heard about you volunteering for defense against the dark arts. How are you feeling? I heard that you broke through the Imperius, but I don't think it would have felt good. On the contrary, Professor, being under Imperius is quite relaxing. As long as you ignore the commands, it's quite nice, actually. McGonagall seemed relieved to hear that. If Quinn wasn't happy and he informed George West, Hogwarts, especially Moody and Dumbledore, would have a lot to answer. After conversing a little about the OWLs and other things, McGonagall said farewell and took her leave. When the professor left, Quinn took out Recon and switched to Moody and Barty Jr.'s place. Hmm, now that's surprising, is it? Barty Jr.'s red label had turned to purple. Well, he did teach, so it kind of makes sense. 
Anyway, let's get back to it, said Quinn and returned to building the timepiece for his new pocket watch. Quinn West, MC. Work hard, work smarter. Marcus Belbley, a good friend, will punch Quinn if necessary. Eddie Carmichael, Ravenclaw jock. Like Quinn, he loves Moody's fake eyes, but for different reasons. Luna Lovegood, Hogwarts Quibbler Supplier, DOB, February 13, 1981. Barty Crouch Jr., Alastair Moody, feeling doubt in his magic capabilities. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 137, 11 Years, Trifecta, and the Fourth. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.patreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor. The night sky was aglow with the bright lights of the stars, shining upon even the most remote places. The pale crescent moon shone like a silvery claw among the blanket of stars that stretched to infinity. Quinn was standing on his favorite outdoor place in all Hogwarts, the astronomy tower, the tallest tower. The calm wind of the night stroked Quinn's face, making his skin tingle with a slight cold. He liked the astronomy tower because of the unique peace it had. A couple more minutes, said Quinn while looking at his new pocket watch. Just a little more to September 8th. In a couple of minutes, the day would turn to September 8th, that is, the day Quinn had arrived in this world. Eleven years of living in the magical world of Harry Potter. He sighed. How long had it been since he had thought of this world as the world of Harry Potter? It had been a while since he had stopped looking at the world he lived in as a fantasy world of fiction and had come to recognize it as something real. He had lived in this world seven years before coming into contact with the Potters. He had gained a new family, formed new relationships, and made a place for himself in this world. He had found something he loved from the bottom of his heart and had developed close connections with people he cared about. All those elements had made this world go from something he had read about in books and enjoyed as movies to something real and genuine a thought that didn't seep through him until now that he was thinking about it. A part of him still couldn't believe that it had been so long. He had been living in a world of magic for over a decade. He moved to the side and started to remove his clothes till he was in a simple white tee and white shorts before returning to the center of the tower. He stood there waiting for it to happen. Four years ago, he had experienced a late transition to the stage of magic development that children from 11 to 17 years old enjoyed. They would enter a state of magical flux and have a better focus ability and an increase in the quantity of magic in their core. Using magic would accelerate and boost their results. Quinn wasn't sure if it would happen again, but he hoped that it would, as he would gain lots of benefits. He had tried to research on this subject matter, but upon extensive reading in his personal library, the room of requirements, and the few days of access to the restricted section of the Hogwarts library that he had been able to get from multiple professors, stating that he needed research material on their subjects, hadn't given him anything conclusive. I'm prepared. If it happens, then good. If it doesn't, I will go on with my life. Quinn would have no qualms about spending 11 years in this world even if they went unrewarded. After the day four years ago, Quinn had already mapped out how much magic he would have at his 18th birthday, which was the day the flux state would transition into maturation. He knew how much work he would have to put to get maximum gains from the seven years and had planned short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals for achieving the best he could. The boost from the Sin Vault had been an unexpected blip in his plan, and he had had to redraw the development plan to assimilate the bizarre year and the changes it had brought. As long as I keep working hard, I will come out as the world's magically powerful 18-year-old at the end of this. Better than Dumbledore, Grindelwald, Voldemort, or any other magical that has walked on this planet, thought Quinn. These were the gains he would naturally get in his life. Thus, Quinn wanted to be the person who took the most advantage of it by the time his life ended. 
a sound resembling a tuning fork being hit broke. The silence of the night and caused Quinn to look at a corner where his neatly folded outer garment with his new pocket watch sat. It's time. It was already September 8th. Quinn closed his eyes, seconds passed, and Quinn stood still with no movement, and all he noticed was the sound of crickets in the background. He opened one eye and looked left and right. What? Is it happening? No? Let's wait a bit more. He closed his eyes once again and waited for a while. But nothing happened. Eventually, an hour passed and nothing happened. Was it wishful thinking? I seem like a fool. Yeah, an idiot, said Quinn, smacking his lips. He picked up his clothes, got dressed, and went back to the Ravenclaw common room after wasting one hour. That was stupid, complained Quinn in his bed as he pulled up the sheets. He went to sleep feeling irritated with himself. Sleep took over Quinn after half an hour of silent bitching and moaning. The second Quinn entered REM sleep, inside Quinn, his soul started to thrum and vibrate in a space outside of the physical plane. The foreign soul that chanced upon a different world and resided in a body, not of its world, started to go through a transformation. The soul that had nothing to do with magic was able to access it through the native body. Through the years of being in contact with the mystical energy known as magic, the soul had been slowly changing, transforming to gain access to magic. After eleven long years, the transformation was complete. The soul had normalized being in contact with magic. It now held the same properties as any other soul that could be found in a magical. And as Quinn slept, the soul finally went through a qualitative change. The body had always been from this world had always been able to access magic. The mind, through its connection to the brain, which was a part of the body, also could access magic and, with ample training and daily use, had become enabled with magic. Now that the soul was going to get direct access to magic, Quinn would finally be one. The magic from the soul plane crossed over to the physical plane, and the dorm room that had three fifth-year boys lit up. The light was so bright that it passed right through the bed curtains. A window that shone with a bright light could be visible from Hogwarts, and anyone looking from the outside would wonder what the hell was happening. The common room down the stairs was getting light from up above, and even the other dorm rooms along the staircase had bright light coming through the doors. The owner of the soul slept through the entire process along with the whole Ravenclaw student body. Mind, body, soul. The ultimate trifecta was now complete, working in a symbiotic union to function as the magical human known as Quinn West. Quinn lay on his back, looking at the ceiling. After waking up at six in the morning for years, his internal body clock made him wake up at six o'clock. He sat upon his bed, his hands stretching above his head. As always, his sheet slipped off his body and started to fold itself, and as he stood up, the bed cover would fix itself and the pillows would become fluffy once again. He then walked to the bathroom. The three had to brush their teeth. With a sway of his hand, he made his toothbrush magically move. Quinn's eyes were staring down, still a little drowsy from the late last night. He breathed through his nose and stood up straight. He closed his eyes and stretched his body to shake off his lethargy. His eyes opened up with sleep out of them and peered at the mirror in front of him. For a second, the toothbrush kept brushing, but what Quinn saw surprised him so much that he lost control of the brush. The toothbrush with lathered paste fell down, but before it could touch the floor, it stopped, hovering a bit. Staring back, Quinn had his handsome face with a mild case of bed hair. But instead of his usual stone-gray eyes, his two orbs were a vivid purple in color. What the hell, said Quinn with toothpaste in his mouth. He leaned closer to the mirror, left hand on the edge of the sink, while the right pulling down the lower eyelid to get a better look at his eyes. Why are they purple? But before Quinn could get an answer, he blinked, and his iris were back to their usual stone gray. What? He spat out the paste into the sink and twisted the tap to let out water for gargling. Quinn felt the usual control he had over water when he touched the tap, but then he found himself staring at the running water. The running water stream thrummed, disturbing the flow. As he stared at the water, Quinn's ears picked up the sound of his heartbeat. As that sound got louder, the thrum in the water started to match with the heartbeat, 
eventually coinciding with each other. Every beat of his heart matched a thrum in the water. His eyes went up from the tap to the mirror, but this time he wasn't looking at his image, but the water pipes behind that carried water to the faucet. Quinn slipped into the feeling and found that he could feel every water pipe in the bathroom. The sense of water inside the walls became stronger as he sunk deeper into the state. Quinn felt like he could squeeze the water out of the metal pipes, the bricked walls, painted surfaces, or simply force the water to burst out, ravaging everything in the way between the water and him. He didn't do any of that. Something happened last night. Quinn was sure of it. I didn't have this level of control last night. Quinn's control over water was top-notch, but this level of sense where he could sense it through layers of obstruction hadn't been in his skill set. The young magical dove deep into his body and snooped around his magic control, but there were no changes. With him just waking up, the magic core was full, and it was as full as yesterday. His mind immediately went to last night. Something definitely happened, repeated Quinn, and flexed his magic to test out if something was different. Everything in the bathroom, from the mirror to the shower head to the far right, rattled. But he wasn't expecting the sudden yell from outside, and Quinn knew exactly who yelled and why. He ran out to see Eddie on the floor beside his bed, and Marcus standing up on his bed, looking alert in confusion and surprise at being woken because of the sudden sound and shake of his head. What? What? Was it an earthquake? said Marcus. I don't know. Ugh, my elbow hurts, groaned Eddie as he held his elbow, which contacted the ground when he fell off the bed. I didn't feel anything, said Quinn, lying, as he was the reason behind everything. Inside his mind, the thoughts were running at the speed of light. Holy shit! It just came pouring out. Quinn had to pull out the magic from his core every time he wanted access to it. As his focus ability increased, the process got more accessible, faster, and he could pull out more and become more precise with the measurements. Right now, he had wanted to pull an amount to rattle everything in the bathroom, but the amount that had come out had been enough to shake everything in their dorm. Whatever, now that you guys are up, don't go to sleep. You are both coming with me to run, he said, ignoring the groans. He went back into the bathroom and threw up a silencing ward. For the love of magic, I am awesome. The rapturous laughter echoed inside the bathroom, staying inside the four walls, as the silencing ward did its job. Quinn then walked out and found that both of his friends had gone back to sleep. Marcus, all you can eat at the three broomsticks at the next Hogsmeade weekend. It's on me. Eddie, you too. I will buy you enough butterbeer so you can bathe with it if you want. The response he got was two pillows to his face. For an entire week, Quinn's mood had been at an all-time high. Experimenting with his new magical capabilities had been exhilarating. His control now was so smooth that Quinn felt he had been running with weights around his ankles. That entire week he busied himself with going over every piece he felt had ever learned and performing them one after another. He found that not only his control over them got better, but his magic regeneration was also faster. If before he could call upon one unit of magic out of his core, now it was more precise to say he could call a third of that amount as the minimum. An ability that helped him out immensely with delicate applications of magic like transmutation with great details and alchemic procedures that required a tight grip on magic flow. Right now, he was sitting in his workshop looking over a cauldron inside. In it, there was a bubbling poison that turned the stomach acid into a corrosive liquid capable of burning through the stomach and other entrails. A bubble head charm laid over his face for protection from the fumes. His concentration was interrupted when he heard a voice inside his workshops. Quinn? Looking up from the cauldron, Quinn saw a half-transparent fat ghost dressed in monk robes sticking out of his glass wall. Friar, fancy seeing you here, said Quinn. At the same time, he thought about researching for some wards to keep ghosts out, which was difficult, as a ghost's existence was tied to the very magic of Hogwarts. I, you didn't visit me, so I decided to come to you said the Ravenclaw ghost. Oh, sorry about that, Friar. I was going to visit you but got a bit distracted, said Quinn, as he continued to stir the cauldron. I wondered whether you want to challenge the next vault, 
said Friar, studying Quinn's reaction. I will challenge it, Friar. It's one per year for me, answered Quinn. Now that you're here to give me the next clue, heh, with you here, I'm getting excited for the next vault, Friar. Come on, tell me about it. Last year, Quinn and Friar had a talk about the results, and Quinn's performance was all Friar needed to see to believe he had completed the vault. Friar thought that Quinn had found secrets to some ancient magics that had allowed him to perform feats not possible for a child of his age. If that's what the challenger desires, then that will be what he gets, nodded Friar. He came out of the wall and floated above the cauldron. His grayish body turned a slimy yellow. Dark is the forest and deep, and overhead hang stars like seeds of light. In vain, though not since they were sown was bread. Anything more bright, and ever more mighty multitude ride about, nor enter in, of the other multitudes that dwell inside. Outside is white and gold, inside is for brave and bold. Venture through the deep and treacherous mines, pointless all it would seem, but persist through the endless vines, the reward is grand, I deem. Ha, huh, said Quinn as he sat down on a bar stool. Friar, did you work on the rhyming? That I did, said Friar, feeling proud. I got tips from the sorting hat. It taught me from its millennia of experience. That made Quinn laugh. He could imagine the hat and Friar talking to each other about poems, rhymes, and songs, a magical artifact with a personality and an imprint of a departed soul exchanging notes on building music and riddles. Quite bizarre, indeed. It definitely worked. He said, noting down the fourth riddle, and done. That's it, Friar. Quinn looked up and smiled. I'm ready for the challenge. Quinn West, MC, I am not a computer. I don't need to shut down to install an update. Friar Hufflepuff Ghost, music, is mighty. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 138 Forbidden Forest, Centaur's Underworld. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Liu. Author's note, please read before proceeding. There is a public post on my Patreon page, meaning that it's free for all, unlocked for everyone to see. You don't have to pay a single nut to access it. The post has what I see of when I think of Quinn. It's his character appearance. Of course, I'm a firm believer of free imagination, so you can imagine him in any way you desire while adhering to the simple written descriptions that I've provided throughout the story. The link to my page is in the synopsis and at the top of this chapter. Change the accented O to a standard O. You can also search Fiction Only Reader Patreon on Google to get to my page or add Fiction Only Reader in front of the standard Patreon URL. Thank you. Please proceed as you wish. Three days after Friar gave Quinn the riddle, he was walking across Hogwarts's grounds. There was short green grass under his steps as he moved north, away from the castle. The sun was bright, although there were clouds skidding along the sky that provided a much-needed aid from the heat to the inhabitants of the land. Ahead, Quinn could see the humping willow standing in all its glory. It swayed gently, as if performing a dance to the sound of nature. While it seemed gentle, it wasn't. If you stepped close without precautions, the big willow wouldn't show mercy, and branches as thick as pythons would assault whoever approached without mercy. However, a pinching hex from afar to the knot at the base of the tree would calm the woody guardian. He walked past the humping willow and started walking on a narrow, winding earth track that disappeared into thick black trees. While Quinn was looking at the forest, a light breeze lifted his hair. Dark in the forest and deep and overhead hang stars like seeds of light, sang Quinn. He stepped into the forest that was dark as coal. The bright and sunny day rapidly shifted into darkness. Quinn lifted his chin to look up at the thick canopy that covered the sky from his view. Thin beams of light would occasionally sift through the spaces between the leaves like stars in the night sky. In vain, though not since they were sown, was bread anything more bright. His hands brushed against the dark bark of one of the trees. Quinn stopped near one of them and scouted the area ahead. He could see beech, oak, and yew filling the forest. 
Kneeling down, Quinn let his hand ruffle through the grass. He plucked a small herb that growed in the darkness of an encompassing canopy. Not grass, said Quinn in identification. Quinn twisted the grass-like herb with his fingers. Essential for polyjuice. I wonder if Barty has come to pick some up. Quinn got up and continued his walk. A place where more than a few students had disappeared over the centuries since the school's inception. That was the reason the forest had been named Forbidden Forest. As Quinn continued to walk deeper, the forest started getting denser, its trees started growing closer to each other, and not a peep of noise could be heard except his footsteps. An ever more mighty multitude ride about, nor enter in, of the other multitudes that dwell inside. He continued to sing the riddle. He didn't have to walk in silence for long, as Quinn heard knocking of hoovers and a gallop from his right, beyond a maze of trees, just outside of his vision. Oh, they found me, huh? whispered Quinn. Precisely what he wanted. Quinn patted his chest, and the noir transformative suit, which had been in the green camouflage mode, changed to a black camouflage to suit the dim lighting and dark trees around him. He pulled up the hood over his head, and with a wave of his hand, a black mask covered his face, and into the view came, was it a man or a horse? The figure had the waist of a man with red hair and beard, but below, he had a horse's gleaming chestnut body with a long, reddish tail. A centaur. Behind that centaur were six more of different shades and colors, bringing up the tally to an auspicious seven. The half-men galloped around Quinn with arrows drawn upon their bows pointing at Quinn. After seeing that the human wasn't making any movements, they stopped running around and surrounded him. Their arrows, though, were still pointed at the unknown figure. Human, why have you intruded into our home? asked the red centaur. Quinn turned in his spot and observed the seven centaurs. He had seen centaurs during his travels and talked to a few, but this was the first time he had met some with their weapons pointed at him. Seeing that the human in front of him wasn't replying, one of the more hot-hearted centaurs pulled the bowstring tauter. Speak human. Centaurs. Residents of the forest, started Quinn, his voice distorted. I have no qualms with your kind. I want nothing from your kind. I solely desire to reach my goal. He turned towards the calmer leader and asked, Lead me to the vault that is cursed, and I will be on my way, not to be seen ever again. The forbidden forest was too big and clustered for Quinn to spend his valuable time searching for the vault. He needed a guide. The mention of the vault that is cursed sent a wave of whispers among the centaurs. They were not prepared to hear those words, and a few of them rested their bowstrings and lowered their weapons. Human, how do you know about the cursed mines? asked a centaur, his horse tail swaying gently. He looked older than the rest of his companions. Hmm. So the mine in the riddle is literal, thought Quinn back to the last paragraph of the riddle. I am a challenger who aspires to test my mettle against the cursed vault that is here in the forbidden forest. Impossible. There hasn't been a human challenger for the cursed mines, exclaimed the hot-hearted centaur. The hot-headed centaur hadn't been born back then, but he had grown up listening to stories about challengers from the elders. Stories about multiple centaurs that had ventured the vaults and paid it with the ultimate price, their lives. Show me which way to go, centaur, and I will be off, said Quinn. He didn't need a guide. He could find the path on his own. We won't do that. Why? asked Quinn with his magically distorted voice. We don't trust you, answered the head of the small herd. He looked Quinn up and down. He wasn't impressed by his attire. Shed that disguise of yours, and then we talk. That isn't needed, centaur, said Quinn. Show me the correct path, and I will leave your kind alone, just as your kind desires. Quinn's words caused their bows to be aimed at him again. This time, though, the threat didn't go unanswered. The centaurs heard a crackle and saw icy blue beneath the human's feet. The temperature dropped. Suddenly, an unnatural cold enveloped them. I don't wish to fight, said Quinn in warning. This is our territory, human. You won't tell us what to do. Quinn turned to the centaur who had said that. Be careful, centaur. I'm not of your kind, so think carefully before you decide to shoot at me. The tension between the two parties grew, as some of the centaurs felt the need to launch their arrows with cold growing increasingly chilly around them. And just when the dam was about to break, stop! 
a voice gave a pause to everything. Eight pairs of eyes turned to see another centaur. He had blonde human hair and the body of a palomino horse. He looked younger than the rest of the centaurs. Firenze, what are you doing? asked the leading centaur. Mercury has left the House of Secrets and has entered the House of Ambitions, said Firenze. The stars were clearer than ever last night. I believe they were showing me something. Quinn tilted his head in confusion. If there was one magic that Quinn didn't understand, that was divination slash seer magic. He had no aptitude for it. Although he used the stars and planets posit, ions when he brewed some potions, when he performed alchemy, and when he needed to do some runic interpretations. Have you gone senile, Firenze? Planetary movements don't trouble themselves with actions of worthless humans, yelled the oldest centaur of the group. Quinn ignored the rude jab. In a way, living beings had no worth at all, considering the size of the universe. He wants to challenge the cursed minds. As far as I know, no human has ever challenged it. Even we ourselves haven't dared in decades. This is big enough for the stars to show me something, declared Firenze. Quinn stayed silent. This Firenze was making his job easier. He didn't mind letting him do the job for him. Besides, we can't harm a child. It's against our honor. A clumency came faster than ever and clamped on Quinn's surprise. Donning his noir transformative suit hadn't been a fashion statement. He used it to stay hidden, to keep his identity confidential. And now that centaur just revealed his age. Child? I don't see it, muttered the red-haired centaur and turned to look at Quinn. He has the vitality of a child. Look closer, and you will see it. The sun illuminates him, instructed Firenze. His younger age didn't make him a lesser divinator. No. Firenze had a more potent seer blood running through his body, which gave him a stronger connection to his sight. Three of the seven centaurs found Firenze to be correct and put down their weapons. The rest who weren't well-versed in divination followed the others. A centaur's honor didn't allow them to hurt a child. Firenze gazed at the figure dressed in pitch black, and even though he couldn't see the face, much less the eyes, he knew that the human child was looking back at him. I shall guide you to where you want to go. Follow me. Quinn stared at Firenze and at the rest of the centaurs for a while before finally stepping forward. The chill that enveloped the area subsided. Though he didn't drop his vigilance, as he exited the circle of centaurs, he moved to Firenze's side. The centaur and the human lead the way. The seven other centaurs followed behind, keeping their distance from the human who had intruded in their home. Why do you desire to enter the cursed place, human? asked Firenze. I never understood why even my kind wanted to go there. So many have lost their lives, saddening their families, just because they wanted to explore the unknown. Quinn didn't reply. He just walked through the forest, occasionally snapping the branches, tendrils, and roots that threatened to trip him. Tell me, child, how did you know about the cursed pits? We thought that the pits were the secret of our forest. I wonder how you, a human, know about them. The question was returned with silence. Quinn saved in his memory the path they were taking. He didn't want to interact with the centaur, but he couldn't concentrate on his task when he could feel Firenze's intense gaze looking at him from his side. What are you doing, centaur? Quinn gave Firenze a side look. It's strange, very strange, muttered Firenze. His eyes stared at Quinn as if looking through him. There seems to be a haze over your fate. I can't see through it. I haven't seen something like this before. Quinn's eyes widened a fraction, and his distorted voice warned, Stop it, centaur. Stop whatever you're doing. I don't want the sight to be used on me. Why? asked Friar in surprise. Looking for signs of the future was a part of centaur culture. He couldn't understand why Quinn would refuse. I and fate don't get along. I don't want to hear what she wishes for me. I stay outside of her interventions. The last thing I want is for her to take notice of me, explained Quinn. He didn't want anyone with the sight or power of a seer to tell his fate to him. Quinn feared that someday a divinator would make a prophecy about him. That was the last thing Quinn would ever want. He preferred to have freedom instead of knowing something vague about an uncertain future where there was a high chance of him getting involved. Ed, we are here, noted Firenze. He pointed out the way with his hand. Quinn looked at the place the centaur's hand indicated. 
The place he stood in was dim by all standards. The canopies did a good job in blocking the majority of the light. It was almost impossible to see what lay ahead. It was too dark. The trees looked darker than ever, and the eerie chill didn't seem to welcome many living beings. It looked like the pitch-black darkness of the place seemed to suck in everything, not even letting the light escape. The ones who live inside aren't kind even to us residents, much less to an outsider like you. Have you made up your mind, young challenger? If you go inside, you might not come out. If I go inside, then the ones who live inside might not ever get a chance to get out, said Quinn. His distorted voice and dark attire made it seem like a demon issuing an ultimatum. He turned to Firenze. Don't bother to wait, Centaur. I'll manage to find my way out. With that, Quinn stepped into the darkness until Firenze couldn't see him anymore. May the stars be with you, Challenger, said Firenze, and he walked away. Quinn stood still in the blackness. He was unable to see a single thing around him. But unlike in T. Holmes delight, he wasn't able to move unrestrictedly because of the branches, vines, trees in his path. Unlike in Tehom's delight, orbs of light appeared around Quinn. I can light things up. The shimmering orbs of light floated away, cycling around Quinn, creating a circle of visibility, illuminating everything within. Much better. He stepped over a now visible over-the-ground route and began his journey to the unknown part of Forbidden Forest. Slowly making his way inside, he passed through a maze of beech, oak, pine, sycamore, and yew. Every tree had been tainted with a coal-like tinge, a tinge that matched its surroundings. Even with shimmering magical orbs shedding ethereal light, the surroundings remained bleak and morose. The dead plain through which Quinn passed quickly came alive as a rustling of leaves began to be heard. Suddenly, a horse-sized, eight-eyed, eight-legged, black, hairy, gigantic spider leaped toward him from a crouched position. Quinn turned his head back. A screech shattered the silence as an acromantula smashed against a magic blue crystal shield. The shield caused its skin to scorch, causing the spider to leave the place screaming. Knew that it would come in handy, thought Quinn. Not a shield spell he would regularly use as he would normally strike from the distance. Click, click, click. The spider wasn't alone. He had brought his companions along, and they didn't seem to like Quinn as acromantulas of various sizes threw themselves against his shield. What in the world? Quinn's eyes darted from side to side as his shield was continuously attacked by carelessly lunging acromantula bodies. Quinn began to worry as he began to see their bodies pierce the shields just before they walked away from the pain of the intense burns. I'm not that tasty, gulped Quinn. His mind was racing among the screams, screeches, and click-clack of pincers. All right, I've had enough. Time to go on the offensive. Ice started to form around Quinn. Tens of spikes started hovering around him, growing till they were the size of his arms. And then it began. The spikes shot out towards the spiders, nailing them and drawing their blood. Immediately after, another set of ice spikes would appear, and another wave of spears would hit out. I need to get out of here. I'm not equipped for this sighed Quinn while keeping on shooting out spears towards the horde of spiders. He couldn't see anything outside his cycling lights, and Quinn couldn't have that. Right now, he didn't even have an idea about the number of foes that surrounded him. He started to ran while firing ice spikes and pouring magic into the shield. The spiders in the meanwhile were trying to ram him from behind, right, left, and above. If it hadn't been Quinn, they would have been in true, blee from the strain of magic consumption. Having to deploy hundreds of ice spears while maintaining a shield would have been like an impossible feat for most wizards. Ah, I can see light, said Quinn. But I'm not going to make it out this way. Need a little boom boom. There were just too many spiders in front of him to get out without an explosion after all. Quinn melted the ice and clasped his hands together. Suddenly, an orange light started to build up between his palms. Quinn's eyes remained fixed on his hands, ignoring the fact that the acromantula's pincers were coming dangerously close to him, only being safe because the spiders couldn't stand the pain of being burned. The orange light began to get brighter as the seconds passed. Two, six, ten, fifteen seconds passed before Quinn looked straight ahead and opened his hands. An orange flash covered the entire area. 
The light was so bright that all the shadows seemed to disappear. Even though Quinn couldn't see, he believed in his magic, so he ran forward. He didn't meet a single spider in his path. He kept hearing clicks and squeaks in all directions, but his path ahead was clear. With his eyes on the ground, he jumped over a large root. He rolled in the darkness to a comparatively brighter part of the forbidden forest. He did not let go of his shield and immediately prepared himself. Curses with destructive capacity flared over his hands, but there was nothing. The spider seemed to have disappeared as if they had never existed. Quinn's breathing became labored, his eyes alert, but nothing came out. He looked at the violet spell on his left and the maroon spell on his right. He shot them into the darkness. To no avail. Not a sound could be heard. What the hell? He hadn't been injured, but that had been the most overwhelming experience Quinn had ever had. Who knew what creatures awaited inside for him? Quinn for sure didn't know what to expect. What he knew was that if he wanted to achieve his goal, he would have to go through their residents. Residents that lived in the dark, black, and gloom. Residents that lived in the underworld. Quinn West, MC, was worried for a second. Firenze, Centaur, strong seer with a connection to the luminaries. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression. Move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 139, Imposter, Delegation, Small Talk. If you want to read it. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, my don.com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Liu. Just as Quinn had predicted, Moody had announced that he would be putting the imperious curse on each of them in turn to demonstrate its power and to see whether they could resist its effects. But, but you said it was illegal, Professor, said Marcus, uncertain, as Moody cleared away the desks with a sweep of his wand, leaving ample clear space in the middle of the room. You said that to use it against another human was... Dumbledore wants you to know what it feels like, answered Moody, his magical eye swiveling on Marcus with an unblinking, eerie stare. And I've already performed it to West. I should go to Azkaban for all we know. It won't cost me anything to do it again on you. However, if you'd rather learn the hard way, when someone's attacking you, fine, you're excused. Off you go. Marcus hung his head and walked back in defeat. Quinn rested his elbow on his shoulder. You're overthinking about it. Relax a little. It will be over before you know it. What if he asks me to do something horrible? Asked Marcus, his forehead sweating with anxiety he was feeling. You'll be fine, said Eddie, chiming in. Unlike Marcus, he didn't seem worried. Whatever he does, it won't be worse than you almost fainting and wetting your pants in front of the banshee boggart. El, like you're any better. Who was the one to clean his bed for a week after seeing a boggart becoming his mum? quipped Marcus. Quinn couldn't help it. A short laugh escaped him despite trying to hold it in. He turned his head away, but Eddie could see Quinn shaking in laughter. Oh, shut up, spat Eddie, his cheeks pink. The boggart, becoming his mum, had scared him enough to clean up for an entire week. The timid and gentle Ravenclaw seemed to have forgotten his anxiety and worries about being subjected to the imperious curse. His shoulders were no longer tense, and the pallor of his skin was improving. I wonder if the Ministry knows about this, thought Quinn, wondering whether Dumbledore had informed the Ministry about this teaching method or not. Well, I hope the Ministry won't interfere. He is a good teacher, I guess. Moody began to beckon students forward in turn and put the imperious curse upon them. Quinn watched as, one by one, his classmates did the most extraordinary things under its influence. Eddie hopped three times around the room, yelling out the lyrics of his favorite song. Katie Brown imitated a grumpy cat. Marcus performed a series of quite astonishing dance moves he would certainly wouldn't have been capable of in his normal state. Not one of them seemed to be able to fight off the curse and each of them recovered only when Moody removed it. West, called out Moody as students walked out at the end of the class. Stay back. I want to talk to you. Quinn gazed at the imposter, before gesturing to Eddie and Marcus to go on without him. I will catch up to you guys. Eddie and Marcus exchanged looks before nodding and exiting the classroom with the rest of the students, 
leaving Quinn and Moody alone in the classroom. The desks were pushed to the side, and Moody was standing in the middle. Yes, Professor. What do you want to talk about? It's your fifth year, lad. Have you thought about what you want to do in the future? After Hogwarts, asked Moody, his natural eye fixed on Quinn, and surprisingly, the usually restless artificial eye, too. I want to travel the world, Professor. Learn magic and have new experiences, answered Quinn, his eyes trying to see where this was going. Hmm. Have you thought about becoming an Auror after Hogwarts? said Moody, as he took out a silver flask from his waist. He pushed it up against his scarred lips and took a swig. Auror, Professor? Yes, Auror. We haven't been doing well on recruitment lately. We need some new path good blood within our ranks. You being able to shrug off the Imperius along with your grades would make you a perfect candidate, spoke Moody, his eyes darting up and down. Oh ho, he certainly is playing his role, thought Quinn. He found it absolutely hilarious that a disguised Death Eater was recruiting him to become an Auror. I haven't thought about being an Auror yet, Professor. From what I have heard, it's a rewarding job, but other than that, I haven't given much thought about becoming an Auror or a Hit Wizard. What subjects are you going to take next year? asked Moody. The man seemed to have gotten used to his new professor occupation. All the subjects that I have now. I'm trying to keep my options open, replied Quinn. He was sure he wouldn't get something below an outstanding O. Oh, good, good. Give it a thought. We need wizards like you in the Force. You never know when the next Dark Lord will come along, nodded Moody, putting on a face of vigilance. If you ever have any problems, don't hesitate to come to me. I would love to see you grow to your full potential, West. I see a lot of promise in you. Thank you, Professor, nodded Quinn. Moody nodded, and without a word, briskly exited the classroom with his wooden leg making distinctive clunking footsteps going up the corridor. Trying to build connections, eh, Barty? whispered Quinn, smiling. I'm Quinn West. All professors love me. I'll play along with you for now. After finishing their classes, 24 students gathered inside a classroom in the Transfiguration Wing of Hogwarts. They sat in different parts of the room and divided themselves into groups. The door opened, and Minerva McGonagall and two students entered the classroom. Good evening, Prefects. I hope everyone is well, said McGonagall. Is everybody here? Let's see. 10, 18, 24. Excellent. Everyone is present. She walked to the professor's podium and looked over the four groups and the two students that had come with her. The head boy and head girl. They were sitting down in the center of the room. As you all are aware, the delegations from Bobatons and Durmstrang shall be arriving in a week, and we will need to make them feel welcomed, said McGonagall, pausing for a second. As representatives of Hogwarts, you will need, as prefects, to be role models for the entire student body. As such, I expect all of you to be on your best behavior. Furthermore, make sure that every student follows your lead. It is crucial that we maintain a proper image in the eyes of the delegations. We mustn't show any unsightly behavior, especially in front of them. She gave the 26 students a no-nonsense look. Am I understood? The student representatives silently nodded. No one was willing to crack a joke in front of McGonagall when she was like this. Excellent nodded the deputy headmistress. Moving on to the next topic of this meeting. I need volunteers to help out the foreign students during their stay at Hogwarts. Your responsibility will include to be an intermediary between them and our students, to answer any questions they have, to guide them through Hogwarts until they are used to the castle, to cater to their needs, and to solve any problems that might arise between them and us. McGonagall, who was looking at the parchment on the podium, didn't notice that every prefect was giving a discreet glance to one person in the room. Any volunteers? asked McGonagall, looking up from the podium. A few hands raised in response. All of them were curious about the foreign students, but only a few were confident enough to deal with the responsibilities. Good, nodded McGonagall, smiling at the number of raised hands. Before I assign you into two groups, I want to know if any of you speak either French or Russian or both. A seventh-year Slytherin girl prefect that was sitting with the Slytherin group raised her hand. Miss Parlett, which language do you speak? asked McGonagall. I have a question, Professor. 
said P. Arlet, lowering her hand. I understand that Beau Batons is in France, but Durmstrang's location is unknown. As the students speak Russian, does that mean Durmstrang is in Russia? No, Miss Parla, the location of Durmstrang is still unknown. Russian is the language requirement if you want to attend Durmstrang. Students communicate and learn in Russian. It's their lingua franca, so to speak. Whether Durmstrang is in Russia or not, that we don't know. It's in Norway, came a voice from the Ravenclaw group of prefects. Every pair of eyes in the room, without exception, turned to the voice. Mr. West, why do you say so? asked McGonagall, sighing. She knew she wouldn't be able to move on without listening to the answer. The fifth-year boy prefect, Quinn West, sitting smack in the middle of the Ravenclaw group, spoke up. I believe we should start with the coat of arms in order to figure out the location of this school of magic. The tone of voice and pace of words grabbed the attention of everyone. There's a double-headed eagle in the Durmstrang coat of arms, and this eagle was the symbol of the Byzantine Empire. Afterwards, Albania, Austria, Germany, Greece, Russia, Serbia took it too. Another thing we can see is an onion dome, which is associated with the architecture of the Orthodox Church in Eastern Europe. Furthermore, the word Durmstrang is written in Latin and Cyrillic alphabet. Almost everyone in the room except Quinn blinked when he started to lay down some history. Some of them, who noticed Quinn's neutral expression, started to wonder whether this was considered common knowledge or not. It didn't seem so to them, at least. Even though we don't know the precise location of Durmstrang, a lot of people have tried to locate the school. From all that effort, we have found with 100% certainty that the school is in the north of Scandinavia. That much we already know, quoted Quinn, some knowledge he had gathered. Given that they will be arriving by ship, we can deduce. Mr. West, how do you know the Durmstrang delegation will be arriving by ship? asked McGonagall, as she had yet to reveal that piece of information. I have my sources, Professor, answered Quinn offhandedly. Where was I? Ah, yes, as they will be coming by ship, and the fact that the Great Lake is connected to the ocean with waterways, we can assume that the school is near a water body like a sea or an ocean. The prefects and the head pair looked at each other with questions in their eyes. The Great Lake was connected to an ocean? They didn't know that. McGonagall, who noticed the looks, sighed inwardly. This information wasn't restricted, so to speak, but it had been kept secret. This had gotten to the point that, aside from a few students, no one knew about that. If we put this information together, I can say with reasonable certainty that Durmstrang is in Svalbard, which is a Norwegian archipelago in the Arctic Ocean. Everything fits. The archipelago was discovered the same century the school was founded, Moreover, for centuries it had been part of the Russian Empire, that is, until the 1920s when it became Norway's. The population is partially Norwegian and partially Russian, which explains the cultural hints in the symbols of school. And the lands there. There are mountains and lakes. Also, these lands are almost not populated by muggles, which makes it a great place to hide a school of magic. There were no words spoken after Quinn finished, and except a few short claps from the Hufflepuff group, the room was silent for a moment. Mr. West, do you know how to speak Russian? asked McGonagall. Hmm. Ah, no, Professor, I can't speak Russian, replied Quinn. He wasn't acquainted with Eastern Slavic languages. McGonagall held back a sigh and took a moment for herself. While the history and theory were fascinating, it wasn't the time for it. The deputy had a lot on her plate and she needed to finish this meeting quickly so that she could move on. Let's get back to the topic. Is there anyone who can speak E, either French or Russian? One arm raised from the crowd and McGonagall once again held back a sigh. Yes, Mr. West. What is it? I can speak French, Professor. You can? asked McGonagall, taken aback. Yes, Professor. I'm half French from my mother's side, answered Quinn. I can speak French with near-native fluency, I can also speak Latin and Italian at a level where I can hold a conversation with a native without any problems. I'm getting Spanish to that level. Just need a little work on it. I need a speaking partner to get some practice. Finally, I added Portuguese to my repertoire last year, but I find speaking it hard. I will probably become fluent by next year. The Romance languages were the languages that had evolved from vulgar Latin between the 3rd and 8th centuries. 
The six most spoken Romance languages were Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, Romanian, and Catalan. Quinn had learned French from his grandfather, Latin on his own, because a lot of his books in his library were in Latin. In regards to Italian, he had practiced it together with Leah because their mother spoke it. Finally, he had picked up Spanish and Portuguese because all the Romance languages were quite easy to learn if you knew Latin. As he learned more and more Romance languages, it got progressively easier for Quinn to pick them up. That's great, said McGonagall, lethargy disappearing from her face in an instant. Mr. West, you will be a part of the French group. Please make sure that they don't have any problem. Quinn took out an AID card from his pocket, held it with his finger, and with a flick of his wrist, the black card went flying across the room, arching beautifully in midair before gracefully landing on the professor's podium. Way ahead of you, professor. McGonagall picked up the card. It was the familiar black card with golden text, but her eyes widened a fraction when she noticed the language. It wasn't English. This is French, professor, said Quinn. The Russian cards will arrive here by the end of the week. As I said, I'm not fluent in Russian, so I had to ask a Russian translator to translate the text. The Russians' cards will arrive here before the delegations, so we're good. I see, said McGonagall. She could almost see it. French and Russian students taking the modified cards and finding the AID office to solve their problems. Mr. West, you, you aren't going to charge them, right? Quinn smiled. If they ask me something that enters in the role of being a prefect, then no. If they ask the owner of the AID, I'm sure we can work something out. It's just a matter of the services they require, Professor. Please make sure to inform them, would you, Mr. West? I don't want complaints from their side, said McGonagall. Of course, Professor. Always absolute professionalism. The meeting ended after McGonagall divided the prefects into groups. The French delegation with Quinn in it would be led by the head girl from Hufflepuff. They had a small meet of their own before the prefects would be free for the day, except their routine patrolling. Quinn was getting out of the transfiguration wing, making his way to his office when his name. He turned to see Cedric Diggory jogging his way towards him. Diggory, what can I do for you? asked Quinn. He and Cedric were acquainted well enough for him to talk to Cedric twice or thrice a week. I was going to the fourth floor and wondered if you would walk with me, said Cedric, his patient calm yet charming smile on his face. Of course, there is no need to ask, replied Quinn as Cedric fell into step with him. So I heard you're going to participate in the tournament. Cedric was in his sixth year, but since his birthday was after September, he joined a year later and was already of age, making the Hufflepuff Seeker eligible to participate in the Triwizard Tournament. What? How did you know? I haven't, asked Cedric, genuinely feeling shocked that Quinn knew about his decision. I've my ways, Mr. Diggory, said Quinn with, Haysha hint of a smile on his face. Have you thought it through? From what I've found out, the tournament is going to be dangerous. Are you confident in your abilities? Cedric recovered from his shock and nodded with confidence. His body language was screaming that there was no doubt about his participation. Yeah, I'm sure. Hmm. Well, right now, all I can do is to wish you luck. The chances are strong, though, said Quinn. He took out an AID card and held it in front of the Hufflepuff. Cedric was about to politely refuse, as he already had a card with him, but then he saw that it had a new design, so he took it. If you ever need anything, anytime, contact me, and I will sort it out, said Quinn as he joined his hands behind his back. If you get selected as the champion, then you'll get a massive discount. I would help you out at dirt cheap prices. Practically free, I say. Cedric grinned at those words. He had been to AID a couple times, and not once he had been disappointed. I will probably come to practice my spells against you. Who knows, maybe I'll win. Quinn laughed at the statement. Cedric was talented and knew his magic, but his chances were infinitely low in front of him. Let's keep them private. I don't want my record to be tainted. Need to keep it at 69. Can't have it go to 70, can I? The 69 streak had been paused because of his lust-infected brain, but Quinn was trying to get over it now. If Cedric knew the significance of it, then he didn't show it and simply nodded. They separated on the fourth floor, 
with Quinn climbing up to the fifth floor. I need to keep an eye on him, thought Quinn. The events had changed, and Quinn was sure that what happened in the books wouldn't happen. But there's no harm in keeping an eye out for all of them, thought Quinn. He was going to be very observant this year. He needed to be. There was only one week until all parties arrived at Hogwarts. The clock was ticking. Quinn West, romance language enthusiast. Alastair Moody, Barty Crouch Jr., has his own plans. Minerva McGonagall, deputy headmaster, the busiest she had been in decades. Cedric Diggory, Hufflepuff, champion candidate, prefect. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 140, Tournament Preparation, Consultation. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at .patreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan. The next day, notices were drafted and put up on the notice boards in the common rooms and the places that had high activity for students to see. About the Triwizard Tournament. The delegations from Bozotons and Durmstrang will arrive at 6 o'clock on Friday, 30th October. Lessons will end half an hour early. Students will return their bags and books to their dormitories and assemble in the Great Hall to greet our guests. Participation is mandatory. Absence from the feast or any unsightly behavior will have consequences. Brilliant, said Eddie. I'll have care on Friday. I'm seriously thinking about dropping the subject. I like Hagrid, but the man just demands too much. Eddie sighed. He was thinking about how much time he had had to spend observing and handling magical creatures to write his reports. The 30th, that's less than a week away. I can't believe we'll be sharing classes with two other schools. Marcus spoke, his eyes still looking over the notice, memorizing the spellings of the school names. Uh-huh. More customers. Smiled Quinn. Luna, we have to be prepared for them. Today we'll be going through the changes we'll make to accommodate them. Okay, I'll bring pudding, nodded Luna. I hope they don't bring Nargles in. It would be a pity for the Nargles to return. They haven't done so since last year. The three boys exchanged glances, nodding in recognition. They knew what Luna meant when she said Nargles. Since last Christmas, they had been making sure no one made fun of Luna, but they hadn't been sure 100% because Luna never told them anything, so hearing that the Nargles had disappeared from her life was confirmation that she wasn't having any problems. They won't, Luna, said Marcus, smiling gently. Your Nargle repellent items must have finally worked. The appearance of the notices around the castle had a profound effect upon its inhabitants. The Triwizard Tournament seemed the only topic discussed in the following week. Lots of rumors started to spread from student to student as if they were a highly contagious virus. Who was going to apply for the Hogwarts champion? What the tournament would ask for? How the students from Bobotons and Durmstrang would differ from each other? Etc. Quinn noticed, too, that the castle seemed to be undergoing an extra thorough cleaning. Several grimy portraits had been scrubbed, much to the displeasure of their subjects, who sat huddled in their frames muttering darkly and wincing as if they had raw pink faces. All armor started to gleam and move without needing to hear squeaking noises. Argus Filch, the caretaker, was so ferocious to any students who forgot to wipe their shoes that he terrified a pair of first-year girls into hysterics. Other members of the staff seemed oddly tense, too. After a stressful and challenging class, McGonagall could be heard reprimanding Neville about his dismal magical skills. He had knitted cactuses on his ears, and begging him not to show this to the delegations. Flitwick, who had used a stack of books to make himself taller so that he could see above the podium while teaching, would fall down multiple times a day. Sprout almost had a killy-shoot weed breakout in one of her greenhouses, which nearly reached the other greenhouses in a single night and came dangerously close to destroying other produce. Snape would be more snappy at the students, which, in consequence, would make their lives a little bit miserable every second both inside and outside his classroom. However, Quinn wasn't worried about it. The tensions that grew between prefects and professors didn't affect him. 
He was used to dealing with multiple different people every day and knew the language of the people he was going to handle. There were cultural differences that he would need to look out for, but other than that, Quinn was all set up for the job. Quinn went on his day without change. He had a lot of work to do, and one day only had 24 hours in it. Currently, he stood in front of a raised table deck, his eyes focused on the task in front of him. On the table sat a wooden quad stand, and atop of that stand was fixed a tri-clawed gripper. His hands were by the sides of the stand. From his fingertips, a pulsating red sphere with magical yellow threads moved into the gripper. Test number 41, said Quinn, and a fountain pen scribbled Quinn's words. The yellow threads of magic glowed intensely as Quinn poured in the magic. The red sphere began to change, with veins appearing all over the sphere. Quinn's face brightened as he saw positive progress, but his joy was a bit too early as the red sphere began to squirm and wriggle before the sphere turned into a blob of goo and dripped on the stand. For the love of, groaned Quinn and waved an irritated hand over the mess for it to vanish as if it was never there. With a face that seemed as if he had sucked on a sour lemon, Quinn said, result failure, compilation failed, reverting the process back by 10 stages to test number 31. Quinn had made a development decision on test number 31, which was supposed to come together on test number 41, but he had being wrong, as test number 41 had shown. Ugh, back to the drawing board. With another wave, potion vials, beakers, burners, herbs, preservation jars, among other things, flew across the room to their respective places. A paper slid across the table, and with a fountain pen that Quinn had grabbed out of the air, Quinn started to write out some notes. He did as such whenever he made some progress or to correct something. Ding! Quinn heard the familiar charm his office had. A customer had arrived. He cleaned up and walked out to greet the student in need. He found. Miss Granger, he said before turning to her companion, the redhead, green-eyed girl. Ivy. The think tank of the Golden Squad was standing in his office, something he hadn't been expecting any time soon not after the memories associated with this office in particular. How may I help you ladies? He said as he sat down. He invited them to sit down as well. The duo wasted no time in doing so. Quinn expected them to start right off the bat, but they didn't. After a little while, he noticed their expressions and the general vibe that was between the two best friends. Did you two fight or something? Asked Quinn, noticing that the two faces were facing slightly away from each other and the light crease between their brows. She's being stubborn, said Ivy, giving Hermione a subtle side look. She's being archaic, said Hermione, full-on glaring at Ivy. Huh, that is interesting, said Quinn, humming. A fight between the inseparable power duo? Not something you could see every day. What I don't understand is why are you two here? Don't get me wrong, I'll be happy to solve your conflict, but you know, we are here so that you can stamp some sense in her head, said Hermione with a tinge of viciousness. Not from where I'm sitting. You're the wrong one here, spat Ivy. She said that with such fury that it seemed Hermione was an offending stranger. Ho ho, I see. Tell me then. What's the issue here? I would love to help, said Quinn. The two girls were so busy glaring at each other that they didn't hear the laugh in Quinn's voice and the glitter in his eyes. House elves! exclaimed Hermione with some heat. There are house elves at Hogwarts and not some, but hundreds of them. Did you know about this? Quinn blinked his eyes, and he immediately understood what they were fighting about. He had never been so fast in deducing something. He was very familiar with what was going to follow. Yes, Miss Granger, I'm aware of the presence of house elves in the castle, said Quinn. He regularly met them when he dropped by the kitchen. Then you must know that they don't get paid or get holidays. They have never heard about sick leaves or pensions. They are being treated as slaves. Besides, there is not a single mention of them in Hogwarts, a history. What is this? This was the first time Quinn had heard as much passion from the top scorer of her year, and if he was honest, he was a little surprised by its intensity, even though he knew it was coming. See? scoffed Ivy, jutting her chin towards Hermione with her arms folded, a derisive smile on her face. Hear the nonsense she's spouting? This idiot has no idea what she's talking about. Damn, thought Quinn. He was enjoying this a bit too much. 
he turned to Hermione and asked her a question. Miss Granger, may I ask why you came here? You know that I'm a pureblood who has been born and brought up in a magical household and community. I, I didn't think of that, replied Hermione. For a moment, it looked like she would be able to restrain her anger a bit. She glanced at Ivy and saw her smirking, and that brought the frustration and anger back. You could have simply gone to Professor Potter. She is a first-generation witch just like you, but unlike you, she has been a part of the magical community for way longer, said Quinn. She's too busy with the tournament preparations. We decided not to disturb her, explained Ivy. I see. Let me ask you something, Ivy. Why do you think it's all right for the house elves to work under these conditions? Ivy shrugged in answer. They obviously like to do work. I haven't met a single house elf who doesn't like to work, so why take it away from them? To Ivy Potter or any person who had grown up in the magical community, the existence of house elves was common sense. Look what she's saying. As they like to work, let them work. They are obviously brainwashed for who knows how long, and now all of them feel like their current situation is something normal, said Hermione. Okay, I understand the crux of the matter and what seems to be the problem, said Quinn, nodding. I understand both of your positions. Your background and upbringing are the reason behind your thoughts. However, unfortunately, none of you are right, I'm afraid. Their arguments had no logical or solid reasoning behind them. I guess I'll have to explain to you why house elves behave as they do. I hope that by the end of my explanation, both of you will have a level of understanding behind house elf behavior, said Quinn. House elves are magical beings. In fact, on average, they use more magic than we humans do every single day. Unfortunately, they don't possess magic of their own. The expression of surprise and confusion was evident on both of their faces. Ivy, because she hadn't been taught that fact, and Hermione, well, she knew through books that house elves used magic to perform household tasks, so she didn't clearly understand what Quinn meant. They don't require a focus to perform magic because their internal focus is potent enough for them to perform a wide range of magic, but in exchange for that versatility and magic conduction, they lose out on the internal source of magic. If we, humans, didn't have our intelligence, we wouldn't be the dominating magical race on the planet. We don't have that naturally potent internal focus that so many other races have. Like their non-magical counterparts, magical humans' intelligence was why they could be the top race capable of hunting more powerful races like dragons, nundus, thunderbirds, among many other powerful races. Unlike us, who have a magical core in our bodies, house elves lack that. They can perform magic, but they aren't able to garner it. But nature and evolution granted them a way to gain magic. They evolved with the ability to draw magic from an external source, smiled Quinn, thinking about the wonders of magic and magical creatures. The source? A few races were compatible with them, humans being one of those races. And because humans populated the Earth more than any other compatible races, house elves gravitated towards humans. They ha v the ability to use magic in return to slave-like life, that doesn't sound like a fair deal to me, argued Hermione. To us humans? Yes, that isn't a fair deal, but house elves aren't humans. Magic shares a deeper connection to them than to us. They need to perform magic to feel free. Without it, they feel restricted, their existence bound. Their life without magic isn't great at all. In some cultures, house elf blood was used as focus cores because of their potent internal focus core. It wasn't used in any of the wand-using countries because of the image house elves had, but a few countries had no qualms using house elf blood. In some ways, you're both correct, said Quinn to both of the girls. House elves don't have to serve to use their magic, but after being under the rule of humans for generations, they have eventually understood that if they took care of their houses, then humans would give them magic. Repeat that for centuries, and you'll get a race that has servitude as a normal part of their lives. They have accepted it and crave for it because their instincts tell them that this will get them magic. I guess brainwashing might not be the correct term, but it's close. They enjoy work because it allows them to use magic, and if they do their job correctly, humans will be happy, and thus they'll keep getting magic. Polly, he called, and with a pop, there was a house elf standing on the table. 
Why little master call me? Ivy and Hermione Hermione watched with interest and surprise at the house elf that stood on the table. They had seen house elves, but this one was different from the others. She wasn't dressed from a dirty pillowcase or rags, but in a clean toga. She had a simple crest of crossed wands, with a galleon on the intersection, and behind that was a peacock with its plume spread. Magic, money, and wisdom. This is Polly, the West family house elf. She's part of the family. I wouldn't be able to imagine a day where she isn't family, said Quinn. Polly turned to see two girls sitting in the chairs and then looked at the table. Little Master had guesties and gave no tea? Missy Rosie no be happy. It's fine, Polly. They'll be leaving in a bit, yet smiled Quinn before turning to the girls. The problem isn't servitude. It's the way humans treat house elves. You don't need to free them because their lives would become miserable if you do that. What you need to do is change the way they are treated. He turned to Polly and asked, Who are you bound to, Polly? Little master's father's fathers. And has grandfather ever mistreated you? No, the big master is good. Quinn turned back to the girls and continued, Polly is family. Yes, she does most of the housework, but that's because it's her life. We don't stop her from doing things essential to her life. She has her own interests. Polly likes to learn new recipes, new ways to clean the house. She likes to find paints that go well with each other, and myriads of other things. She is her own individual, and we respect that. Nothing special, just basic, humane treatment. Little master need Polly? asked Polly, looking impatient. No. Polly, I just wanted to prove a point. Okay, Polly go now. Polly busy. And then she popped away without another word. I have a question, said Ivy, unfolding her hands. She leant forward. Ask away. Are all house elves here connected to the headmaster? Oh, no, said Quinn, shaking his head with a small smile. 137 house elves would be too much of a load for one person. The house elves are connected to the castle. They are connected to Hogwarts. Hermione raised her hand in question. But you said... Hogwarts is a special place, Miss Granger, said Quinn. It is filled with us students, and that has changed its nature to a mystical one. I haven't found the reason yet, but house elves are compatible with Hogwarts. Hermione and Ivy stayed silent for a moment. Quinn didn't disturb them, but took out two half-slips of paper and started writing on them. Thanks for explain, Inji. I would have gone down a different path if I didn't know this, said Hermione. I know, chuckled Quinn. He slid two half-slips across the table. They stopped when they were before the girls. This is for the both of you. The girls picked one slip each and looked at them with confusion. On the paper, they saw a charge of three galleons for a consultation session. Apologies if I assume wrong, but I split the bill, smiled Quinn and looked at them. Ivy looked up from her bill. She said with an expression of disbelief, You are rich. I know, nodded Quinn. Believe it or not, the rich care more about money than the poor. Now, pay up. Their meeting ended with Quinn smiling at the sound of galleons hitting his table, happy to be of service. Quinn West, MC, cough up the money lassies. Polly, house elf, little master can be silly, wasting Polly's time. Ivy Potter, red cat, short three galleons, but made up with Hermione. Hermione Granger, brunette cat, short three galleons, but made up with Ivy. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis.